I'm Warren, he's Charlie. <laughs> uh, there's one thing I should probably clear up first because I know it's puzzling you. In the movie, he always gets the girl. <laughs> now, that's hard to figure out, isn't it? <laughs> but I've... Uh, Uh, but uh, I finally understand what the uh, what's happening. It it's something called the Anna Nicole Smith rule. <laughs> it's when choosing between two old rich guys, pick the older one. At the <laughs> <laughs> if we can get the spotlight up there on Andy Hayward. Andy does that cartoon for us every year. He travels around, he gets the voices in there. Andy, where are you? Uh, uh, he comes up with the ideas. Andy is the, runs Deke Entertainment. Deke is the one I've told you about in the past that produced Liberty's Kids, which I think is probably the best way not only for youngsters to learn American history, but for people my age as well. I mean, it's a terrific series of of uh, young kids, uh, a couple of young ones, uh, in the time of the American Revolution. I watched uh, several of those episodes, and I'd forgotten a lot of American history since since I was in uh, school. It's just a really, it's a wonderful series. Uh, it appeared on PBS over time, and uh, uh, if you're looking to learn American history or have your children or grandchildren learn it, you, you couldn't do better. In the months ahead, he's, he's working uh, uh, on the uh, the Secret Millionaires Club, but it's 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 going to be a program that's designed to teach young people some of the very basic lessons of about money, uh, how to avoid getting into trouble with it, and, uh, how to uh, how to use it effectively, and what your attitude should be toward it. So we're looking forward to getting that out early next year, and uh, uh, I, I'll guarantee you that it'll be a a terrific uh, program for for uh, teaching children and your grandchildren something about the subject of money. I'd like to have a special uh, introduction for the man that first uh, uh, taught Charlie and me uh, something about the value of franchises and the advisability of buying great businesses instead of cheap businesses. Uh, prior to the purchase of C's Candy in 1972, uh, I intended to look primarily at financial measures in buying businesses and uh, buying things that were cheap in relation to book value. And we always tried to get a lot of tangible assets in relation to our money. But we found out that the intangible assets, if properly nourished and if properly identified, uh, you can make a whole lot more money with than buying a lot of tangible assets. In 1972, early in 72, Charlie and I went to C's Candy, which had been in the hands of the C's family for uh, for many decades, and we bought it. And of course, Charlie and I didn't know a thing about making candy. We were pretty good at eating it. Um, and we needed someone to run the place. We met a young fellow there. Uh, it was clear to both of us that that he was the ideal person to run C's Candy. And in just a few minutes, we, we made a deal with him that's lasted a lifetime. And if Chuck Huggins and his wife Donna would stand up, I'd Love to have you give him a real well-deserved round of applause. As you notice, my daughter, Susie, uh, produced that movie. She does every year. She works hard on it, and uh, uh, we don't pay her anything, although she does remind me occasionally when I'm out of Borsheim's that she worked very hard on the movie. Uh, I literally know of no directors of any large publicly owned companies that have universally as significant a percentage of their net worth in the company uh, purchased in the open market as that group. Do you, Charlie? Anything? None. None. Okay. Well, let's, uh, that may be all you hear from him, folks, so <laughs> kind of savor it a little bit. You know. We released our, our earnings yesterday after the close. Did we withdraw those earnings, Mark? Oh, oh no, they uh, they stood up another six hours of audit or so, and 
As you can see, we don't pay any attention to realized gains or losses. We had some gains this year. We had some losses in the first quarter of last year. So, but that's meaningless in any sh in the short term. Over time, obviously, it makes a difference. You know, we, we, we do not pick anything to buy or sell in any given quarter, any given year in the way of securities based on the effect it will have on our income account for, for that period. It, it's totally immaterial. In fact, we'd rather sell things that we have a loss in just from a tax standpoint. If we have some high tax cost stocks and some low tax uh, cost stock, we'll sell the high one and record the loss because we would got a better tax result that way in the, in, for the short term. So we ignore that. But if you look at the operating earnings, you'll see that in those main divisions that I take in the annual report, I show our four major businesses and then investment income as a side. Things worked out pretty well in the first quarter for all of them. I would caution you that in our insurance underwriting, our worst quarter would normally be expected to be our third quarter. You're not going to have hurricanes in this hemisphere in the first quarter. Uh, the real exposure, the worst exposure is in the third quarter, and then there's a lesser exposure in the fourth quarter. We write a lot of catastrophe insurance business. Uh, earthquakes, as far as we know, uh, don't have any particular uh, seasonal aspect to them, but, but hurricanes definitely do. Now, the interesting thing is that under standard accounting, if we write a hurricane policy uh, for the calendar year 2006 and we receive a million dollars of premium, we would earn a quarter of a million in the first quarter and a quarter of a million in the second quarter and so on. We would earn a pro rata throughout the year. And that, in our view, actually is not proper accounting, but it's, it's required accounting. The real exposure to loss is primarily in the third quarter. So. You can't take our insurance underwriting results in any way for a rather benign quarter like the first quarter and extrapolate them uh, for the year. But nevertheless, it was a very good year, a very good quarter. Geico had excellent growth. I believe that our, I'm, well, I'm almost certain that our growth in the first quarter was better than any of our main competitors and actually by probably by some margin the underwriting was very good. Our reinsurance underwriting was very good. Genry had a good quarter. Our smaller companies had a good quarter. So things generally have been working very well in all four sectors, and that's nice, but that's not terribly important. I mean, five years from now, nobody will remember whether the first quarter or the second quarter was that good at Berkshire Hathaway. But what did happen, and which we announced last night, which was very important, the acquisition of a large, extremely well-managed, profitable, uh, really extraordinary company called Iskar. Up until October of last year, I knew nothing of Iskar. I did not know about their extraordinary management, but I got a letter, and I got a letter from Aton Wertheimer, and maybe a page and a half, page and a quarter, and he told me something about this business. And sometimes character and talent sort of just jump off the page at me. And this was one of those letters. It came from Israel. I expressed an interest after reading this letter and in getting together with Eitan. And not long thereafter, I met not only Eitan, but his CEO and president, a remarkable man named Jacob Harpaz, Danny Goldman, a CFO, and we met in Omaha. Uh, they subsequently met Charlie. This all came to fruition, signed a contract. Now we have, well, before I go on to this, maybe maybe Charlie would like to say a word or two about this car, because he, he's, hard as it is for you to believe, he is not only, he's, he's as enthusiastic about this as I am. Now, have you ever seen that before, I ask you? <laughs> Charlie likes this one extraordinarily well. Charlie? Well, this is a company that from very modest beginnings, rose to be the best company in its field in the world. It's not yet the biggest, but that leaves the, them something to do. The average quality of the people in this company is not only extraordinary, it's off the chart. And the 
beauty of this, as you look at the two of us, is they're all young. No, this is a real quality enterprise, and these people know how to do some things that we don't know how to do, a lot. So, of course, we're enthusiastic about the company. You know, I'm always enthusiastic when I get to deal with some of the best people in the world. It's Omaha, it's spring, the, day, the fields are green, the days get longer, and we bring a big family into a new home. I'm standing here before you representing 5,869 people, not only the people, but their families, the past, and, the, and their future. It took us three years to look what to do next. We were successful. We still have a lot of mistakes ahead of us to do. And until we found one day, somebody came to us and asked, have you heard about Berkshire Hathaway? And Mr. Buffett, we said, yes, we heard, but we never thought about it. And when we started, started studying about the company, we understood that this is the right combination for us, a family company with a strong culture and a culture we love to keep, a young group of people that we love to work, maybe not for very long, but not less than 20, 25 years from today, and we decided, let's try it. And we had a very interesting lesson from Warren. We had a very interesting lesson from Charlie. And we survived both of them. <laughs> I'm very happy that I represent here not only the people that make the product and go to the customers, I also, in a way, represent a big family of customers that make manufacture things. They'll make cars go faster and safer. They'll make aeroplane fly. They will make the mold to make the bottles for the Coca-Cola. They'll make a washing machine. They'll make the tools to make a carpet. They'll make many things. And many times, the people that manufacture are a little bit in the shade. And I'm very proud to stand as a manufacturing guy and say, I'm standing for all of them, all our customers, which I must thank them every morning, not only for buying, but also for trying new ideas that we bring and working very hard to stay competitive. Whoever will stay competitive will be there long term. And this is also our goal. Here is Mr. Harpaz, Jacob. In reality, my job is not to disturb. And he, in a very gentle way, fired me 10 years ago. He performed and did better things than I could do. And it didn't make sense that I'll disturb him. So I went on to do other things. We've been in the company only 34 years. And uh, the real job is done by Jacob and many, many other people. I'm sure that you have seen the film in 80 days around the world. And we prepared for you in 61 companies around the world. And I hope you enjoy it. We definitely have to fulfill a lot of expectations. We definitely have to work very hard to make everybody very proud that we join the family, also our people, and for sure, everybody in this room. So let's hope we all be successful and let's look into the future. And I'm looking forward to come every spring to Omaha when, it's green, when the fields are green and the days get longer. In 1889, the appearance of the first automobiles brought with it the need for sophisticated solutions in metal processing. Such were the beginnings of a new company launched by engineers in the U.S. Ingersoll. In the decades to follow, another plant was set up in Germany. Since its creation, Ingersoll has established strong ties with industry, which has placed it firmly in a leadership position. For over a century, time after time, Ingersoll has proved that the best solutions begin with the best engineers. In 1999, Ingersoll joined the IMC Group and discovered that the sky is not the limit, but only the starting point.
Meantime, at the turn of the 20th century, another metal processing plant was established on the other side of the world, in South Korea, Tegotech. In joining the IMC Group in 1997, Tegotech reinforced its position as the main supplier of cutting tools for industry in the Far East. Today, Tegotech has achieved unparalleled success penetrating new markets, streamlining production process, and showing that precise global thinking can cancel distances. In the middle of the 20th century, in the north of Israel, Steph Wertheimer had predicted, from his little shack in Naharia, the global need for more advanced metal cutting tools. The new world demands better solutions, said Wertheimer, and established Iskar. In a relatively short time, Iskar has become the second largest cutting tool manufacturer in the world, a leader in the area of metal removal. Iskar has revolutionized every aspect of machining. Its mission, to apply innovation, quality, and automation on the highest technological level. Among Iskar's groundbreaking achievements are the revolution in cutoff applications, development of self-grip in the 70s, the pioneering triumphs in milling, the heli mill in the 80s, the cam drill, the revolution in drilling in the 90s, and tangential positive milling, the innovative tang mill. These innovations and more have reinforced Iskar's position as the world's leader in development of cutting tools. The combination of Ingersoll, Tegotech, and Iskar has given rise to the IMC Group, taking the best of all worlds and creating the world's best tools. Today's rapidly advancing world demands that we constantly elevate standards, apply ourselves more and more to provide ever smarter and precise solutions, pushes us to advance, to improve ourselves, to lead. They have to be a full line supplier. To be a global company means to be local in many countries, in many places around the world. Other IMC Group companies. E-Teddy Italy, designers and manufacturers of PCD diamond tools for high precision aluminum machining in the automotive and aerospace industry. UOP Italy, producers of high quality solid carbide and high speed steel standard tools and special tailor made designs for applications in the aerospace and dye and mold industries. Utiltech France, expert creative solutions and extra long gun drills for deep drilling and applications that require unique geometries. Unitech Japan, deep drilling. BTA style tools with brazed and indexable heads. And Vertec Italy, design and manufacture of unique counter boring tools for deep and complicated boring applications. If you look outside and you see some cars over there, be aware that in each car at least one part is manufactured by one of the IMC companies for sure. Or you have the product line, the geography spread, the people that understand the language. You cannot start thinking, may I try or may I not try to become automotive supplier. We at IMC have made the automotive industry the foremost objective for all the factories of the group. All the Ingersoll vessels connect to contribute massively to the work of the automotive industry in North America. At the same time, on the other side of the globe, Tegotech Cutting Tools joins the momentum of the rapidly developing Japanese and Korean automotive industries. The alliance between Iskar's developments and the IMC Group has led to comprehensive solutions which contribute to the efficiency of global automotive production and pave the way for production cost savings. We are not only selling tools, we are selling technology. We are selling the customer a better way to make profit. And we believe by giving a solution, it can increase its productivity and the bottom line from the productivity, making more profit for his company. The power of IMC comes clearly to the fore in heavy industry. The unique combination of the three main manufacturing plants creates new opportunities. The geographic location of Ingersoll and Tegotech has led the companies to develop specific heavy industry specialization. 
The innovative geometries developed by ESCAR, together with the design and production of tools made to conform to the special requirements of this industry, places IMC at the forefront of this important industry. Aerospace. If you want to reach far and high, you must be on top of the game in technology, in understanding materials, in daring. The aerospace industry demands machining solutions for exotic and difficult to process materials, proficiency in lightweight materials such as aluminum, and the profound understanding of cutting materials and complex cutting geometries, along with the expertise in building large size tools, make IMC the strategic partner for the aerospace industry. General Engineering. All this vast engineering experience accumulated in every field, in every industry, and in every corner of the world has paved the way for the development of new groundbreaking tools, which streamline production processes, shorten machining time, and reduce costs for every customer in the world of general engineering. After releasing the product into the market, we put another team, our own team, and tell them now compete against the release of the product. In exhibitions, we are recognized as a very, very innovative company. Many times the sentences, let's go there because they must have something new. They always have something new. That's a big compliment. And the innovation will make the difference. I believe that in a way, industry is an art in itself. It's art. It's creation. You create something. You can see it immediately upon entering an IMC branch or factory. The house of IMC is first and foremost a home for employees and customers as one. Years of experience have taught us that this is a vital element for success. Many companies have buildings and machines and a lot of uh, real estate, but it's only people that have a chance to make any difference. I believe with the ambition of the people, with the hard working of the people, we are going to reach the position of being number one. The world demands better solutions. That is why we're here. IMC. This is an important acquisition. Is we paid $4 billion for 80% of the company. Uh, the family remains in partnership with us. They retain 20%. It's the first business we purchased that uh, is based outside the United States. We have others that have operations there. Uh, I think you'll look back on this in five or ten years as being a very significant event in Berkshire's history. And um, it's interesting in this world in which uh, many businesses get auctioned off, figures get dressed up before they sell them and leveraged up and so on. We can. We continue to hear from people periodically who consider their businesses too important to auction. And um, we've never really bought one at auction, have we, Charlie? Did I remember? Is the, is it? I can't remember one either. Yeah. So there's a, there's, there's a benefit in that because, in effect, the people that pass through that filter of caring enough about their business that they don't simply put it up like a piece of meat in an auction are also the people, in our view, that, that, that make the best managers and make the best partners over time. That, that there is something going on in their brain that says this business is so important and the people that are here are so important and the customers we take care of are so important that we actually care about the home in which these businesses uh, reside. and. Uh, I think that filter works very much to our benefit. We've bought uh, a number of businesses in the last um, 15 or 18 months uh, where people have felt that way. And I think uh, the crowning one here is, is this car. So I, I welcome our new friends from Israel. I'm going to go over there and visit in September to see if there are any more girls out there like you and uh, see if we can drum up a little more business. Uh, first, I want to thank Charlie and Peter Kaufman for their wonderful book. I think uh, Benjamin Franklin would be very proud. You said that a country as rich as the U.S. should take care of their old people. This year, I read Pete Peterson's book, Running on Empty, and I was wondering, 
from the standpoint that is the greatest benefit to society, where should you draw the line on entitlement spending? You always have the question in every society, whether it's formalized or not, you have the question of how you take care of the old and the young. Uh, you know, you have people in their productive years turning out goods and services, and you have people that are too young to participate in the turning out of those goods and services, but that nevertheless need them, and you have people that are old in the same position. And starting in 1935, I believe, we uh, statutorily formalized that idea. We'd always felt that way about the young. The school should be there for them and, and, uh, and uh, when they couldn't pay for them themselves and that the society owed a duty to both classes. But in 1935, we took up the idea that the government would provide this base limit. Now, I think there's some merit to the argument that the 65 became outmoded as, as uh, longevity improved. Uh, and that is now being changed to some degree, and I think there's probably some more change needed. But this country has an output of almost $40,000 of GDP per person. And some people, uh, like Charlie and myself, are very lucky to be wired in a way that in a market system we get enormously wealthy. And other people are not so wired, and they come out and they they, in a market system, do not necessarily do so well, and they're fairly lucky if they provide for themselves during their working years, and they do not have the ability to earn at a rate that takes care of them in later years, and society has taken that on. Our country can easily handle uh, the Social Security uh, question. I mean, it, uh, it's, a, and it's, a, it's kind of astounding to me that a government that is quite happy to run a three or four hundred billion dollar deficit now worries a lot about the fact they're going to have a $100 billion deficit or something in Social Security 30 years from now. I mean, the, there's a little bit of irony in that. It is, it is true that if we, maintain, if we maintain the present age brackets, that eventually you have uh, one person in the, in the older years for every two that are producing in the younger years. But we produce more every year as we go along. And uh, there will always be a struggle in a representative society, a democratic society, between how you divide up that pie. But we have a huge pie, we have a growing pie, and we can very easily uh, take care of people in a manner at least as well as we take care of them now uh, in the future from that growing pie without the people in their productive years uh, not ha also having a gain in their standard of living. Charlie? Yeah, I think the world of Pete Peterson, but I don't come to the same conclusion. Of course, if we didn't tinker with Social Security, it would eventually run low on funds. But if the country is going to grow at 2 or 3% per annum for decades ahead, it's child's play to take a little larger share of the pie and divert it to the people who are older. It would be crazy, I think, to think you would always freeze the share of money going to the old at exactly the same sum, no matter how rich you got. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, to pay a little more in the future, to support what I regard as one of the most successful programs in the history of our country. Social Security has a low overhead and does a world of good. It's a very reasonable promise to make, and I wish my own party would wise up a little on how little an issue it is. This is, this is what happens when you ask a couple of guys our age how you feel about treating older people. This is what happens when you ask a couple of guys our age how you feel about treating older people. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, the currently, and you know, everybody talks likes to talk about the unified budget. They, you didn't you didn't hear talk about the unified budget 30 years ago on the national level. But the unified budget means that the social security surplus now gets counted toward reducing the overall budget. So they're very happy at present to take the the social security surplus 
and trumpet the number that is after that. But then when they start talking about a social security deficit out 20 or 30 years, they, uh, they tend to get, they want to separate that off and get very panicky about it. So I, I, think, I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in the argument. How would you design a compensation system in a very cyclical industry that can swing from boom to bust? Yeah, that's a terrific question because if you're, if you're running a copper company now with copper at 350 a pound, you, know, you you can coin money even if you happen to be the village idiot, you know. And and uh, similarly, when copper was at 80 or 90 cents a pound, which has been most of our adult lifetime uh, in that general, it, 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 there were fairly sparse times in, in mining much of that at the time. And that and we design compensation systems at, at Berkshire. We have dozens and dozens of companies. Uh, some of them are capital intensive, some of them are, are cyclical, some of them don't require much capital, some of them are terrific businesses uh, if no one runs them, some of them are very difficult businesses uh, even if the best of management comes. And we have a, a wide variety of compensation systems. You're wise when you say how do you design one for that kind of a situation because so often people come in with sort of standardized systems or whatever the highest system they see is and then then uh, uh, apply it to their own benefit. Most people have left to select their own compensation systems will come up with the appropriate, from their standpoint, comparable arrangement. If we owned a copper mining company in its entirety, um, we would measure it probably more by costs of production than we would by whether copper was selling two for two dollars a pound or a dollar a pound. I mean, the uh, the management has control. Uh, depends on the kind of ore bodies and everything, but they, they certainly have control uh, over operating conditions. They do not have control over market prices, and we would have something I think that would not fluctuate a lot in a business like that. Uh, the the uh, bonus uh, available, but it it would probably tie to what we thought was under the control of the individual that was managing the business. That's what we try to measure. We try to understand the industry in which they operate, and we try to understand the things that the manager can have an impact on and how well they're doing in that. We measure at GEICO, for example, we measure by two unit measures. One is growth, uh, unit growth, and one is the profitability of seasoned business. New business costs money. We want new business so we don't charge that against the, the manager or the 20,000 other employees who share in it. Uh, we, we, do not, we do not want to pay for anything that is not under their control. We do not want to pay for the wrong things. And I would say in a cyclical business that you, you know, if oil is $70 a barrel, uh, I don't think any particular management deserves credit for it. In fact, they all sort of deny that they've got anything to do with it uh, when they got called call before Congress. But I, I, would not, I would not give them credit for the fact that oil is $70 a barrel or $40 a barrel. I would give them credit for low finding costs for over time. I mean, what you really want to do if you have a producing oil company is you want a management that over a five or 10 year period discovers and develops oil at lower than average unit costs. And there's been a huge difference in performance in that among even the major companies. And I would pay the people that did that well, I would pay them very well because they're creating wealth for me. And I would not pay the guy a lot of money that, that simply is cashing in on $70 oil and that really has got a terrible record in, in, in finding it at reasonable prices. Charlie? Yeah, it's easy to have a fair compensation system like we have at Berkshire. And a lot of other publicly traded corporations also have fair compensation systems. But I, about half of them have grossly unfair systems in which the top people get paid too much. We know how to fix Berkshire, but our ability to influence the half of American industry where the compensation systems are unfair has so far been about zero. Yeah, it, one, one thing you may find interesting, we've, we have, I don't know, 68 operating companies. We probably have, Char, I probably have responsibility for the compensation system of perhaps 40 managers or thereabouts because some of them have 
businesses grouped under them. I can't think, again, I can't think of anyone we have lost uh, over a 40-year period uh, because of differences in compensa uh, views on compensation. I also, we've never had a compensation consultant uh, come into Berkshire. They may have had them at the subsidiaries, but they're smart enough not to tell me. Uh, they, oh, it's never happened. I mean, we do not, and we do not have lots of meetings. We don't spend a lot of time on it. It is not rocket science. It's, it's made more complicated than it needs to be, more confusing than it needs to be, because having a system that is complicated and confusing serves the needs of some who want to get paid a whole lot more than they're, 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 than they're worth. And uh, the system won't change because it's working to the advantage of the people that uh, have their hand on the switch, the people that pick the human relations consultants and pick the people who are on the comp committee. Uh, I was put on one comp committee, and Charlie can tell you what happened. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> yeah, we were the biggest shareholder at Solomon. Two of us were on the board, and Warren was on the comp committee, and in that frenzy of envy which characterizes compensation and investment banking, uh, Warren remonstrated uh, softly, I thought, toward a uh, slightly more rational result, and he was outvoted. Charlie used the term envy rather than greed, which is interesting, because that's been our experience, is that envy is probably a bigger motivation uh, in terms of people wanting to be in that top quartile or whatever it may be than, than, than greed. Uh, it, it's a very interesting phenomenon that, uh, that you can hand somebody a uh, $2 million bonus and they're fine until they find out that the person next to them got $2 million one and then they're, you know, they're, they're sick for the next year. Uh, Charlie has pointed out, uh, you know, of the seven deadly sins, that envy is kind of the silliest because you don't feel better. You know, I mean, if you get envious of somebody, you feel worse the whole time. Now, you know, gluttony, you know, I've had some of my best times while being gluttonous. I mean, <laughs> there's a real upside to gluttony. I, I, I don't, we won't get into lust. But, <laughs> but I've heard that there are upsides to that occasionally. But envy, you know, all you do is sit around and make yourself sick and can't get to sleep. But that's, it, it's part of the human psyche, and uh, you see it big time, and you get this irony. The SEC wants even more transparency on pay, which I think, you know, basically is a good idea, except for the fact that it becomes a shopping list for every other CEO when they see that somebody is getting their haircuts paid for by the company, and they decide that they'll they too need their haircuts paid for by the company and they suddenly become big tippers. <laughs> How do you train your successors? What do you tell them? How do you summarize to them what is important to you? And how, if you were able to do so, how would you measure whether or not they have lived up to your expectations? I think actually in reading that letter, you know, that's part of the, part of the reason it's written is to convey not only to our partners, our shareholders, but also to our managers and anybody else in the public, you know, what Berkshire is all about. This meeting, you know, in, in, in terms of what we do, is intended to give a personality and a character to, to Berkshire. And we don't say it's better than anybody else's necessarily, but we do think it's us. And we think we want managers to join us who believe in the sort of operation we have, a partnership with shareholders, uh, a lifetime commitment to the businesses. Uh, we want those people to join us. We want what they see after they join us to underscore the values we have. So everything we do, we hope is consistent with a, what most people would call a culture at Berkshire, so that the written word, what they see, what they hear, what they observe. 
And that is training in itself. It's the same sort of training you get as a child. I mean, you, you, when, you, when you are in the home, you know, you're learning something every day by the behavior of these terribly important people, these big people that are around you. And a home has a culture, a business has a culture, to some extent a country can have a culture. And uh, we try to do everything that's consistent with that. We try to do nothing that is inconsistent with that. And believe me, if you're a bright business Berkshire manager, and they are bright, you know, they buy into it to start with, they see that it works, you know, and it doesn't require formal lessons or mentoring or anything of the sort. I mean, if, if you talk to our Berkshire managers, you would find that they think consistently with how, in effect, Charlie and I think. If, there are plenty of people that don't, and they don't join us. I mean, you know, we, we, we hear all the time from people, I've got one coming in a little while actually, that, uh, you know, nothing's going to come of it because this, this guy has, you know, his, 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 his brain processes things different than mine does. And I'm kind of interested in learning about his business, so we'll get together. But, but uh, it, it wouldn't fit, you know, it would, it would just not, it would be a, a mismatch. And the nice thing about it is our culture is so well defined that there aren't many mistakes in terms of people entering it or behaving in a way inconsistent with it. So I think that, I don't think there's any formal training necessary. I mentioned in the annual report the fact that if I die tonight, there are three obvious candidates to take my place. Now the board knows which one of them they would agree on to tonight. It might be different three years from now. But any of those three uh, would not miss a beat in terms of stepping in to the culture that I hope we have here, because it's theirs too. Uh, Charlie? Well, you know, if Warren has kept the faith until he's 75 years old in maintaining a certain kind of culture and a certain way of thinking, do you really think he's going to blow the job of passing the faith on? What could be more important in terms of his duties in life? Yeah. You all have something. <laughs> you all have something more important to do than worry about the fact that the candle is going to go out at Berkshire just because some people die. This is a, a place where the faith is going to go on for a long time. Of course, at headquarters, we aren't training executives. We find them, and they're not hard to find. You know, if a mountain stands up like Everest, you don't have to be a genius to recognize that it's a high mountain. <laughs> the last time I was uh, this nervous asking a question, I'd uh, just presented my wife with an engagement ring from Borsheim's. Um, <laughs> so, well, I hope you get nervous again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, many closed-end funds which contain emerging market stocks are treating at uh, significant premiums to their net asset values, even when uh, open-ended funds um, can be used to acquire similar portfolios of stocks uh, for the net asset values. This doesn't seem very rational to me. Yeah, I would say it would tend to be. I don't know anything about the specifics that you're referring to on emerging market funds. I haven't looked at the size of the premiums. but. History would certainly show that most closed-end funds, just about all closed-end funds, eventually go to discounts. I actually worked, well, I did, I'll skip that analogy, but the uh, overwhelmingly uh, closed-end funds have gone to discounts. Uh, you know, initially, if they're sold with a 6% commission, of course, the, the initial people are getting 94 cents of net asset value by paying the dollar. But um, I don't, I, if, if I saw two, if I, if I had an interest in buying into emerging markets through other people's management and I could buy a, an open-end fund at X or at asset value, and I had to pay 120% of X for some closed-end fund, you'd have to convince me uh, very strongly that the management of the closed end fund was better. So I think you're you're right. I don't again. I don't know the size. The premiums a few percent. It doesn't really make much difference. But it, 
Occasionally, Charlie and I have witnessed in the past closed down funds that have sold even at uh, 30 or 40 percent premiums over asset value. Overseas Securities was a tiny fund that used to do that for years and baffled everybody, but uh, eventually they will come back down to earth. Charlie? I've got nothing to add. He's hitting his stride now. Number five. I also We're glad to, to have you here, Frank. Frank has just brought out a book, incidentally, that's a history of some of his annual letters. It's a good book, and I recommend you, you get it. What do you see as the upside and downside of majority voting as it relates to raising the standard of ethics in the corporate boardroom? Charlie, you want to take a swing at that? I don't think it will have any effect at all on ethics in the corporate boardroom. There get to be fashions in the government's subject. Uh, I think that the troubles in American corporations are not going to be fixed by something like that. All these reforms have to be considered in the light of the kind of people that are likely to be activist in, uh, in using new powers. And that crowd is a, a mixed crowd, to put it gently. The, the question in the boardroom is to what extent, and it, it, you have to understand it's partly a business situation, it's partly a social situation. The question is to what extent do the people that are participating there think like owners and, and whether they know enough about business so that even if they're trying to think like owners, that their decisions will be any good. And Charlie and I have been on boards of companies with dual voting. Berkshire has that, although it's so minor that it doesn't really make any difference. But we've been on other boards, and I have never really seen any difference in behavior based on, on the nature of the votes that got them into the boardroom. But there's an enormous difference. Uh, I think you'd be blown away if, if you watched boardrooms over the years. There's just an enormous difference in terms of uh, really the business savvy of the people in the room, the degree to which they are thinking like owners as they go along. Um, and uh, I, I, I've seen no, uh, I don't know the dual voting or the lack of dual voting really is going to have very much to do with that. The, the key, I've, I've mentioned it in the past, there's all these fashions, as Charlie says, in corporate governance, but the job of the board is to get the right CEO to prevent that CEO from overreaching, because sometimes you have some people that are very able, but they still want to take it all for themselves. But if they take nothing and they're the wrong CEO, they're, they're, they're still a disaster. So low pay itself is not the criteria. But you want the right CEO, you do not want them overreaching. And then I think the board needs to exercise independent judgment on important acquisitions, because I think CEOs, even I think CEOs, even smart CEOs are motivated uh, frequently in acquisitions by other than rational reasons. And in those three areas, uh, you know, American directors have, I don't think they've given a tremendous account of themselves in, in recent years, whether at dual system places or otherwise. The only cure to better corporate governance, in my view, is that if the very large shareholders start really zeroing in on whether those questions I just mentioned are being addressed properly. If they go on all these peripheral issues, you know, they have a lot of fun and they get in the papers, you know, they have little checklists and they can issue grades and all that. It isn't going to do anything in terms of making American business working better. But if the eight or ten largest shareholder groups, if the really large institutional investors say, you know, this compensation plan doesn't make any sense and we're not voting for the directors, and here's why we're not voting for the directors, you'd get change. But so far, they've been unwilling to do that. It takes the big shareholders. It's not going to be done by any coalition of small shareholders or people sticking things on ballots. But the big shareholders of this country, you know, basically, they've some of them have farmed out their voting even. I, I, I was amazed to find that out, that a number of very large institutional investors have actually just, have actually just turned their voting process over to somebody else. They don't want to think like owners. And, uh, you know, they pair, we, we all bear the, the penalty for that. 
curious to hear what you've learned so far about the other informa information technology companies. Charlie and I have circles of competence that extend to evaluating a number of, of types of businesses, and there are a whole lot of businesses that we won't be able to evaluate. Uh, some of them I don't think, I, th I think very few people can evaluate. I mean, you get outside of, uh, you just get into businesses that where the future is so likely to be different than the present uh, that maybe there's a few people have great insights on it, but we sure don't. We are best at the businesses where we can come to a judgment that they're going to look a good bit like they do now, five years from now, 10 years from now. They'll be bigger, they'll be doing different things, but the fundamentals will be the same. This car will be a bigger company five years from now, maybe a much bigger company, and we may get a chance to do interesting acquisitions. But what you saw there, the fundamentals won't change, the way the people think won't change. Uh, I can name a number of businesses that are bound to change dramatically. I mean, when you think of how much the telecom business, for example, has changed over the last 15 or 20 years, it's, it's, it's startling. Even with hindsight, you know, it's a little hard to figure out, you know, who was going to make all the money and so on. It, it, there's, just, there's just games that are too tough. Charlie says, you know, we, we've got three boxes at the company, in, out, and too hard. And a, a lot of things end up in the too hard pile, and, and it doesn't bother us. You know, we don't have to be able to do everything well. If you go to the Olympics, you know, if you can run the 100 meter well, you don't have to throw the shot put. You know, some other guy can throw the shot put and you'll still get a gold ribbon, you know, if you run the 100 meter fast enough. So we, we try to stay within the circle of competence. Tom Watson Sr., I think it was Sr., yeah, Tom Watson Sr., many years ago said, <clears throat> I'm no genius, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. Well, that was pretty damn smart, you know, and, and uh, we have found a lot of our managers who don't think you know they can solve every problem in the world, but they run their businesses extraordinarily well. Uh, I mean, you do not want to, Frank Martin mentioned uh, Forest River, you do not want to go and compete with Pete Legal in, in his business. He's gonna kill you, you know, and uh, he's very, very, very good. But he doesn't come around and try and tell us how to run the insurance business, because that's, that's not his game. We, we look for people that are very good at at things they understand, and, and, and we don't get any inferiority complex at all about the fact that, uh, well, I, I, the, you mentioned Intel, I believe. I was virtually there at the birth of Intel because I was on the board of Grinnell, and Bob Noyce was the chairman of the board of Grinnell, and we bought, at Grinnell, we bought $300,000 worth of their original debentures, and, uh, you know, I knew Bob. Uh, I thought he was a very, very smart guy but I wouldn't have had the faintest idea how to evaluate the future of Intel then, and I really don't have it now, you know? And I think they probably had a few surprises themselves in the last few years with, with AMD and what's been happening in their business, but how about that's gonna look like in five years? I don't have any idea. And I'm not so sure if you were in the industry, you'd know exactly what it was gonna look like in five years. And some businesses just are very, very hard to predict. Charlie? Yeah, one of the foreign correspondents last year, after looking at us carefully, said, in effect, you guys don't seem smart enough to do so much better than other people as you're doing. Was he looking at me or you, Charlie? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got an explanation? And we said, we know the edge of our competency better than most people do. It's a very useful thing to know the edge of your competency. And I always say, it's not a competency if you don't know the edge of it. I'll have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Bill will explain it to me later. Uh. Consider three hypothetical securities for a long-term investment. Uh, the first would be like a share in median family income for the United States. Uh, the background there that on, uh, in real terms, median family income has been stagnant for approximately 30 years. The second security 
would be a share in all corporate income in the United States. Uh, the background there that corporate income has been taking an ever larger slice of GDP. Finally, a bit more abstract, a share in all capital assets in the United States, and I would like to include all intangible capital assets. Well, I think I'd rather buy Iskar. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, corporate profits, as you point out, have been close to their highs, except for a very few years, post-World War II, and uh, as a percentage of GDP, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine being much larger. It's interesting, while corporate profits is reported, you take the S&P, percentage of book, percentage of sales, go down the line, they're all on the high end. Corporate income taxes really are not that high relative to the total revenues of the country, so you can see that there's been a little disconnect there in, in some manner. But median family income is something that Charlie and I have never even considered. Uh, <laughs> we, we, are not, uh, we are not shooting for that. Uh, it, it is certainly true that in the last uh, five to ten years that the, the, the disparity in, in income uh, has widened significantly and that the, the tax breaks for the wealthy have, have been uh, extraordinary. Um, I've pointed out in the past that most of the members of the Forbes 400, myself included, pay a lower percentage of their income to the U.S. government counting Social Security taxes than does the receptionist that works in their office. That was not true 30 years ago, and I don't think it's something that should be true in a rich society, uh, but it has happened. Uh, and I just computed my 2005 return in 2004, and I have no tax shelters. I don't have a, I don't have a tax advisor. I, I just do things, and at the end of the year, I add it all up. In 2004, my rate was the lowest of the 15 or 16 people in the office, and in 2005, my rate was even lower, and that's courtesy of the U.S. government. That's not courtesy of a lot of tax write-offs or anything of the sort, and I think that's, I think it's crazy, and I don't think the American people understand it very well, uh, and I think that... Uh, if they did understand it, they, they should and would be quite unhappy about it. So I think that, I think that the lower incomes, median and the median, people making medium amounts of income have not shared in the prosperity of the last uh, decade or so in a way that's all proportional to the way the, uh, the wealthy have, have, have participated in it. Uh, the, uh, the last point you mentioned a little too esoteric for me, so I'll pass it over to Charlie. <laughs> well, yeah, I, but I think the main figure that matters to all of us, including the people at the median, is uh, how does GDP per capita grow? And those figures have been very good. And so uh, I wouldn't get too wild on the subject of the median income. It isn't like we're all permanently in some status with nobody moving from status A to status B. There's a huge flux both up and down. And what's really important is that the pie keep growing at a, at a decent clip. All that said, I think that Warren's right that some of those tax changes, tax changes were a little crazy. I mean, they caused more envy than we needed, but I don't, I don't think it's all that important. Yeah, we might think it was more important if we were working at the median income, Charlie. I think. <laughs> what is your opinion on the economics of ethanol? I don't know enough uh, to, to answer the latter part. I know we don't, Charlie and I would not know enough to evaluate ethanol projects. We've been approached on them, and of course they're quite 
popular now, but in terms of figuring out what an ethanol plant is going to be earning on capital five or 10 years from now, it's far easier for us to figure out whether people are gonna be drinking Coca-Cola or e even eating C's candy, which I highly recommend. Uh, so it, you know, it will depend on government policy. It will, it will depend on a lot of variables that we're not particularly good at predicting. It's easy to raise money for it now. I mean, it's a popular item, you know, it's, it's, it's hot. And our general experience is that we don't, we don't look at things very much that are hot at any given time. Uh, uh, I know, I know, I, I know nothing about the, you know, the biochemistry or anything of the sort. Uh, I have a son who was at, uh, head of the ethanol board in, in, in Nebraska. And if I notice that he suddenly starts getting richer than I am, you know, I will suspect that I should start looking at ethanol very hard. But so far, I haven't seen tangible evidence of that. And, uh, there's no question ethanol usage is going to grow. I mean, that, that, that we will see. Generally speaking, ag processing, agricultural processing business have not earned high returns on capital. I mean, if you look at if you look at Cargill, you look at ADM, you look at the big, the big processors, that has not been a, a great business, you know, and, and uh, ethanol could prove an exception, but I'm not sure how you gain a significant competitive advantage over time, you know, with any given ethanol plant. Uh, and if you get too many of them around, you know, it will not be a good thing when you're turning out a commodity. Charlie? Well, my attitude is even more hostile than Warren's. I have just enough glimmers of thermodynamics left in me to suspect that when you, that it takes more fossil fuel energy to create ethanol than you can get out of the ethanol you've created. If so, that's a very stupid way to try and solve an energy problem. Well, considering my family situation, I would say I have friends who like ethanol, and I have friends who don't like ethanol. And I want my position to be perfectly clear. I'm for my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we are in a commodity bubble? Not in, in, in agricultural com commodities. They haven't, they haven't done anything. If you're talking about wheat or corn or soybeans or something. But if you get into the metals, oil, um, you know, we've, there's been a terrific move. Uh, the most extreme probably has been copper, and I would say that well, um, oil, if you go back a few years to when it was at $10 a barrel, it's been more extreme than copper. But you are undoubtedly, it's like, it's like most, it's like most uh, trends. At the beginning, it's driven by fundamentals, and at some point, speculation takes over. The very fact that pe the fundamentals cause something that people have looked at for years uh, without getting excited about, fundamentals change the picture in some way. <clears throat> Copper does get a little short, you know, or, or people get a little worried about currency and maybe gold goes up or whatever it may be. Uh, but, you know, it's that old story of what, what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. And with any asset class that has a big move that's based initially on fundamentals is going to <clears throat> attract speculative <clears throat> speculative uh, participation at some point, and that speculative participation can become dominant as time goes by. And, and uh, you know, famous case always being tulip bulbs. I mean. Tulips may have been more attractive than dandelions or something, so people paid a little more money for them. But once, once a price history develops that causes people to start looking at an asset that they never looked at before and to get envious of the fact that they're because he saw this early and so on, that takes over. And uh, my guess is that uh, we're seeing some of that in the commodity area, and of course, I think we've seen some of it in the housing area too. How far it goes, you never know. I mean, it just, some things go on to just unbelievable heights. Uh, and then, you know, silver went back in there. That was manipulation to some extent, but it got up to $50 an ounce very briefly back in the early 80s. Uh, but the eyes of the world that never looked at silver when it was a dollar sixty or something, or $1.30 back in the 60s, 
you know, everybody in the world was looking at it and some were shorting and some were buying, but it becomes a speculative football. And my guess is that an awful lot of the activity in something like copper now is, is speculative on both sides of the market. If, if uh, and it, you know, if it goes to $5 a pound, who knows, but it, you are looking at a, a market that is, is responding more to speculative forces now than to fundamental forces in my view. Charlie? Well, I think we've demonstrated how little we know about commodity prices by our very skillful operations in silver. I, I think you, you can change that from R to, it's mine actually. I, 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 I bought it very early. I sold it very early. Uh, other than that, everything I did was perfect. I mean, <laughs> we managed to minimize things there with great efficiency. <laughs> Or I managed to. Charlie didn't have anything to do with that. I was the silver king there for a while. We 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 did make a few dollars on it, but uh, we're we're not we're, we're not good at the game of when it gets into the speculative area, figuring out how far a speculative boom will go. And, um, it, we if the fundamentals are attractive, we think we're getting a lot for our money, buying equities or whatever it may be. Uh, we'll make some money. We we will pro we may not make as much money remotely as much money as, as, as somebody who is, uh, you know, plays out the last 30 days or 30 weeks of a, of a real wild orgy. I mean, these things, they tend to be the wildest toward the end. But that gets back to the question, you know, of Cinderella of the ball. I mean, you, you know, you, you're there, you're having a wonderful time, the punch bowl is flowing, and the dance partners are getting prettier all the time, and you know at midnight it, it's going to turn to pumpkins and mice. And, you know, you look around the room and you think just one more dance, one more good looking guy, you know, one more glass of champagne, and you think you're going to get out of there at midnight. And of course, everybody else thinks they're going to get out of there at midnight too. And in the end, it does turn to pumpkins and mice. And in this game, as I've said, you know, Adam Smith said it many years ago, a fellow named Jerry Goodman wrote under the pseudonym of Adam Smith, says the problem with that particular dance for Cinderella is that there are no clocks on the wall, you know, and, and in, the, in, in, the, in the markets, if you're talking copper now, if you're talking internet stocks in 1999, if you're talking uranium stocks in the 1950s, there are no clocks on the wall. And the party does get to be more fun, you know, minute after minute, hour after hour, and then it does turn to pumpkins and mice. The stock market in South America has been growing quickly in the last few years. What do you think about investment opportunities in South America? Our problem in many markets is that we have to put a lot of money to work to move the needle at Berkshire. We've got a market value of 135 billion or something like that. So we are looking to put out hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars at a minimum when we look at marketable securities. And that, that really uh, narrows the field in terms of countries or in terms of businesses within those countries. But, you know, we made an investment about three years ago in PetroChina. Now, PetroChina is one, probably one of the, well, it is one of the five largest oil companies in the world. And yet we were only able to even there to get 400 and some million dollars into it, which fortunately is worth a couple of billion now. But here is a country the size of China, largest company uh, in that, country and even there we only got 400 and some million dollars in although we would have liked to have gotten more but we weren't afraid to go we wanted to get paid more uh, for going into China and we did uh, because we don't know the game as well there uh, we would feel the same way in Brazil I mean we uh, a great beer company down there that a, a friend of mine uh, ran and you know we should have been in that uh, uh, we knew he was a great manager and, and, and he was going to do a great job with it. So Brazil would not be off limits at all, but we'd have to be able to get a lot of money into a business we understood at an attractive price. We would want it to be cheaper than if it were in the United States. We wouldn't understand the tax laws as well, the nuances of governance, a whole bunch of things. But after allowing for that uh, at a price, we would do it we're unlikely to put a lot of money into, uh, Brazil's a big country, but it, we're unlikely to put a lot of money into really small economies because we can't get enough money into them. Regarding the manufactured housing industry, 
what is your outlook on demand? Will lending increase in a meaningful way over the next few years? And are the homes priced uh, attractively uh, relative to uh, competitive products? It's been kind of an interesting history on manufactured housing. If you go back, you have to go back 30 or 40 years, 40 years, I think almost, to have fine volume as low as it's been in the last couple of years. Uh, and the houses are better than, by far better than they were then. There have been years when 20% of the housing, the new housing product in the United States was manufactured housing, one out of every five. Last year, leaving out FEMA demand, you know, we were bumping along for the third year, I believe, just a t tiny bit over the 130,000 level, you know, which is like six or 7%, probably 7% of, of, of new housing starts. So the percentage of the total new housing stock that has been manufactured housing in recent years has really been very low, while the houses are better, considerably better quality uh, than in uh, the, the earlier years. Uh, you can look at the house, we got two houses out there on the exhibition floor, you know, around $45 a square foot, you know, that, that's good value. There's a lot of resistance <clears throat> through local zoning laws and that sort of thing by the local builders to uh, the influx of manufactured housing. <clears throat> We've made progress on that in some areas. We're actually developing subdivisions uh, in that business. The houses were missold four or five years ago in huge quantity because you had manufactured housing retailers selling the properties, <clears throat> getting any kind of a down payment, taking the loans, selling to people that we shouldn't be buying them, taking the loans, securitizing them, so somebody in some insurance company someplace or lost significant sums of money. So you had really an abuse of credit <clears throat> in the field and there's a hangover from that. And it's taken a long time for that hangover to work its way through. Um, I think Clayton Homes, that, which we own, has done a terrific job in both the financing. They should be financed on shorter terms, incidentally. I'm, I'm, if you put them on owned land, that's one thing, but if, uh, but financing them with, for 30 years, in my view, was a mistake. <clears throat> but the terms got very lax for a while, and uh, you know we're bearing the, uh, the consequences of that now. But I think the market will get bigger, but I do not think it will get bigger this year. I, I see a year that, counting some FEMA demand and, uh, and some hurricane-induced demand, and, maybe 150,000 units, 145,000 units. And by industry standards, that's, that's down a lot. Now, the number of plants is down a lot and the number of retailers are down a lot. Clayton's position is, is very strong and their, their record is so much better than anybody in the industry that, that you have to look very hard to find number two. Charlie? Yeah, you asked about stick-built housing and how competitive it was. That's been one of the troubles of the manufactured housing game. Stick-built housing has gotten so efficient, but there the system is aided greatly by Berkshire's subsidiary, MyTech. So, uh, and stick-built housing is, is amazingly efficient when it's done in big quantity with systems like MyTech provides. And if it weren't for that, there'd be a lot more manufactured housing. Personally, I think manufactured housing is going to get a lot better and take a lot more of the market. It may take a considerable period, but that is so logical that I think it will eventually happen. Yeah, somewhere down the road, you would expect 200,000 plus units for the industry, but, but I don't think you'll see it in the next, next year or two. It, uh, the industry has to think through, and they have, they've made a lot of progress on this, but they have to think through what's the logical way of financing these things, and what's the way to make sure that the person who buys it you know, really has an asset that's in excess of their of, of loan value five and ten years down the road. And, no, and really very little consideration was given to that uh, five years ago. It was just a question to put together the paper, sell it in Wall Street, and let somebody else worry about it later on. Clayton did a way better job than other companies in that respect, but those were the industry conditions. Uh, 
that existed then. I think, but I think Clayton will be, Clayton could easily be the largest home builder uh, in the United States in, 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 in future years because that we will be a big part of an industry that, as Charlie says, should be doing more volume. I also think that some of the sin that was in the manufactured housing finance a few years ago has shifted into the finance of the stick-built houses. There is a lot of ridiculous credit being extended in America in the housing field. And uh, it had a horrible aftermath in the manufactured housing sector. And my guess is there'll be some trouble in the stick belt sector in due course. Well, dumb, dumb lending always has its consequences, and usually on a big scale because you don't see it for quite a while. So therefore, it's, it's like a disease that doesn't manifest itself for you know, a few weeks. And, and uh, you can have an epidemic of something like that. And, and when, by the time you know you have an epidemic, you're, you're very well into it. Well, that's what happens in, in dumb financing. And, and you had that, you periodically get it, but you certainly had it in commercial financing in the 80s. And you had the RTC and the savings and loan crisis and all of that, because literally one dumb project was put up after another. A, a developer will develop anything he can borrow the money against. You know, I mean, that, it's, it's that simple. And, and when the, when the inst lending institutions pour the money out for something, it will get built. And that happened in manufacturing housing. It happened in commercial real estate in the 80s. I think it's happened in, in uh, conventional housing here in recent years. And if you look at the 10 Qs that are getting filed for the first quarter of some lending institutions and, and, and the 10 Ks that were last year, and you look at the, the balances increasing on loans for interest that's accrued but was not paid, because people had adjustable mortgages, but they were only adjustable so far. But the lending institutions are taking in the income as if, the, as if it were paid. Uh, you'll see some very interesting statistics. Yes, and some of this dumb lending is being facilitated by contemptible accounting. The accounting profession has not stopped compromising its way into terrible behavior. Our auditing bill just went up. Number 12. <laughs> <laughs> What needs to happen in Russia for you to invest there, whether for Berkshire or for yourself? As you know, in 1998, uh, Walter Rissen's parents don't default in 1998. Uh, in Russia, at least, he was proven wrong. And Charlie and I were inherited the business at Solomon that was uh, in the oil business, big time out in, the, uh, in Siberia. And there came a time when we got to dig the holes. You know, we sent the money in. And as long as we were drilling, uh, we were welcome. And then we wanted to start taking the oil out. Uh, after our money had been used to drill the holes, they weren't quite as friendly. Um, in fact, it was really, really kind of extreme what uh, took place with us. So having had a few experiences like that, it, would, it might take us quite a while before we wanted to sink a lot of money into into Russia. It it, it may be different now, but uh, uh, I don't think it's any certainty. I I, I had uh, breakfast in Sun Valley three years ago this July, I believe it was, with Kordakovsky, and we had a translator there, and. He talked to me about whether he was thinking about listing Yukos on the New York Stock Exchange, but he said, you know, it would require registering with the SEC or something, and he wasn't sure whether that would that was be too dangerous. Well, I don't think he listed there, but he went back to Russia, and he's been in jail now for, uh, well, just about ever since. And Yukos was put into bankruptcy. Uh, with tax claims and, you know, it, I don't, uh, I just think it's a little hard to develop a lot of confidence that the world has changed uh, permanently there in terms of its attitude toward capital and particularly toward outside capital. Uh, Charlie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the situation reminds me a little of poly petroleum 
which years ago was much traded in Los Angeles. And the saying always was, if they ever do find any oil, that old man will steal it. And I'm afraid we have some of that problem in many of the co countries in which we're seeking for oil. Didn't we really have the livelihood of our guys threatened over there, Charlie? When, and, 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 they, I think we sent in some people to get out the equipment, and they said if they sent in the people to get out the equipment, not only would the equipment not get out, but the people wouldn't get out. And that, um, so we understood the situation. <laughs> that was not that long ago. What are your thoughts about the residential real estate market in the U.S., where it's headed, and how is California different, if so? Well, Charlie's our California expert. We, we've managed one time to develop a great piece of property in California, and we spent about 20 years or so developing it, Charlie? Or? Yes, and we got our money back with interest. Barely. Barely, okay. yeah. yeah. We, we finished it at just the wrong time. We, we, uh, the land value that we nurtured, it was a terrific piece of land. Charlie lives there. Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say we spent 20 years no. working on developing the land. And the land value, which in effect we cashed out for what, five or six million dollars, now would have a, the implicit land value would be what? Maybe a hundred million dollars. Yeah. But we finished it at the wrong time. So, uh, you know, it's a wonderful, the climate is wonderful, everything's wonderful about this property. It's just that, that from time to time, even in great localities, you've seen it happen in New York a couple of times, you know, in the last 30 years where the, the swing in properties the values has just been huge. And what we see in our residential brokerage business, and we're in, I don't know how many different states, is we see a slowdown every place. Now we see it most dramatically in some of the, what have been the hottest markets. And the markets where you're going to in my view, you're likely to see the greatest fall off and where you've had the biggest bubble are the ones uh, tend to be the high end market and they tend to be ones where people have bought for investment or speculation uh, rather than use. $100,000 for a house and mortgage it for 270000 and if the value goes to two hundred and fifty, if they have a job and everything, they, they won't move out. I mean, it, it, the you don't lose a lot of money even though the market value on a given day is less than the loan value when families stay together and employment uh, is present and all that. But but when you have in investment type holdings or speculation type holdings, when you in effect have had the day traders, you know, of the internet move into the day trading of, of condos, uh, then you the, then you get then you get transact then then you get a market that can move in a big way. First it sort of stops and then it kind of reopens. Real estate is different than, than stocks. If you own 100 shares of General Motors, it's going to trade on Monday and, and that's what it's worth and you can't kid yourself about it. But if you own real estate, you know, there's a great tendency to think about the one that sold down the street a few months ago. And there's a great tendency to think, you know, you only need one buyer uh, who hasn't gotten the word that things have slowed down and, and, and you'll make your sale. I can tell you that in, in Dade and Broward County, for example, in Florida, um, where the average condo is about 500,000, if you go back to December of 2004, there were less than 9,000 condos listed for sale, and I think 2,900 of them sold in the month. So you were turnover one every three months less than that. Now, the listings are up to 30,000 and the sales are down to under 2,000 a month. Well, 30,000 is $15 billion worth of properties. And you are <clears throat> very likely, you can get real discontinuities in a market like that where all of a sudden people realize that the whole supply demand situation has changed. So I, th I think we've had a bubble to some degree and it's very hard to measure that degree till, till after it's all over. But uh, uh, I would be surprised if there aren't some significant downward adjustments from the peak, particularly in the higher end uh, properties. Yeah, and the man is right that the 
bubbles came in Manhattan and in certain places in California. In Omaha, housing prices are quite reasonable. So it's, it's, the country is not all the same at all. We just got an estimate of the uh, tenants at 24,000, which was about what it looked like from the tickets we had gotten. But, uh, I thank you all for coming on that. Uh, even better, the Furniture Mart, which had sales in 1997 of five and a fraction million, 2003 sales of 17 million, sales last year of 27 million, uh, is up so far two and a half million with the best yet to come. So we're, I would, I would say we're likely to do over 30 million at the Furniture Mart. And that incidentally is about equal to a normal monthly volume for the stores. So you're doing your part. Thank you. <laughs> but you can do more. <laughs> if I don't wear a particular pair of pants or a shirt within two years, I give it away to Goodwill so that someone, that someone else can put it to better use. With 40 billion in cash, I'm wondering whether Berkshire Hathaway should have a similar closet rule for deployment of surplus shareholder cash. It won't, go to, what, it won't go to Goodwill, I promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And what, wouldn't it be better if you had a, a smaller budget and fewer gifts you needed to, you and Charlie needed to shop for once you have more time for the beach and a better chance of hitting some home runs. Yeah, I don't think we'll hit any home runs uh, under any circumstances, but the, you might consider a normal level of cash at Berkshire as being about 10 billion. Uh, although we, you know, there could be circumstances where we'd go below that, but because of the, the, catastrophe insurance business we're in and all that. We, we do not, you know, we do not scrape the bottom of the barrel, but, but we don't need anything like uh, 40 billion. I think you'll see in the 10Q uh, that we have, I think it was about 37 billion at the end of, at the end of uh, March. Double check that. And I'm not counting the cash in the finance business. Yeah, 37 something and uh, we're spending four billion on on Iskar. we've spent we're spending some money on some other things as well but we would be happier much happier uh, if we had 10 billion of cash and all the balance and things that we liked very much and we work toward that end at all times but there is nothing even about the way businesses come to us we've got one idea at present, low probability, but that would take, uh, could take as much as 15 billion or close to 15 billion of cash. And whether it comes to fruition or not, who knows, but we do work on them. And what we care more, we don't like having excess cash around. We like even less doing dumb deals because we do them forever. I mean, if we make a dumb deal, uh, it just sits there, we, we don't resell it three months later by having an IPO of it or something of the sort. So you're right, you're right to say that, that we should be very uncomfortable about the fact that we've got the cash, but, we, but it's also important that we not be so uncomfortable that we go out and do something just to be doing something. I would, I would say it's likely, but far from certain, that three years from now we have uh, signif significantly less, but far from certain that three years from now we have uh, signif significantly less cash, less cash, uh, and I hope significantly more earning power. But the goal of that cash is to be translated into permanent earning power over time. Like I say, with the four billion that we've just committed on this car, you know, we we love having that four billion employed there instead of sitting around in, in, in short-term securities. And that's our job. Charlie and I don't do anything else uh, except appear in movies and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, you know, you're right to keep, keep jabbing us on that because, uh, but we jab ourselves. You know, we, ne neither one of us is basically likes cash. We always want to have adequate cash and we always will have adequate cash. And we are the biggest player in the world in cat insurance. Uh, 
and people come to us because they know we're going to run a place that's very strong financially, but it doesn't have to be as liquid as we are as we are now. Uh, we spent five billion. Well, we didn't spend that much. At the Berkshire level, uh, we spent about three and a half billion on Pacific Corp. Now, we contracted for it a year earlier, but uh, we will get more chances, I think, in that field, but you never can tell when they'll come. Uh, so come back next year, and I hope we have less cash. Well, yeah, I think you, you may get some per perspective on what bothers you. If you go back to the annual report of Berkshire 10 years ago and then compare that report with the last one, Despite the great difficulties of deploying cash, we managed to put an awful lot of wonderful stuff into Berkshire in the last 10 years. So we aren't altogether gloomy about that process continuing. It's been some time since you've commented on Coca-Cola, and now that you're off the board, I wonder if you feel free to comment on it. Yeah, well, I, I won't make particularly different comments from, than from when I was on the board, but Coca-Cola it's a fabulous company. Um, Coca-Cola will sell over 21 billion cases of, of uh, various products, more Coke than anything else, around the world this year, and it goes up every year. It's interesting, the stock in, what, 1997 or 98, whenever it was, sold over $80 a share when the earnings were, I don't remember what, dollar fifty a share or something like that. And the earnings then were not as of good quality as the earnings are now when, you know, they were 217 or something like that. And every year, the, you know, they, have, they, they account for a little greater share of the liquids consumed by people in the world. Uh, they make fabulous returns on invested capital. You know, it's a business that has, exclude the bottling part of it, it has five or six billion of of tangible assets and and makes a similar amount. So there are not lots of big businesses in the world that earn 100 percent pre-tax on tangible assets, and um, it'll it'll be a great business, and it's been a great business. The stock got to what, in retrospect, clearly was a ridiculous level, but you can't hold the present management Neville Isadel responsible for that. And he, you know, if the company sells four or five percent more. Uh, units this year than last year and the population of the world goes up goes up two percent it just means that more people are putting that particular uh, source of liquid down their throats than the year before and that's been going on ever since 1886 so it strikes us as a as a really wonderful business that sold at a very silly price uh, some years back and and uh, you can definitely fault me for not selling the stock. I always thought it was a wonderful business, but clearly at 50 times earnings, <clears throat> it was a silly price on the stock. <clears throat> so we, we like it. We'll own it 10 years from now, <clears throat> in my view. Charlie? No more. <clears throat> Peanut brittle gets caught occasionally, <laughs> but it's worth it. It's worth it, definitely. Well, you hear me in the... What? You, oh, you want some, huh? Get your own box next time. <laughs> have insurance rates hardened as much as you anticipated? And have you seen a significant flight to quality in the last few years? Yeah, I think you're probably acting, asking more about reinsurance rates. The, um, actually, in auto insurance, you can figure it out. Our policies are up more than our premium volume. So the average premium in auto insurance, which, after all, is close to 40 percent of the the whole market for insurance. The average premium in auto insurance is actually down a little bit. Um, but in, in reinsurance, in which we <clears throat> are a big player, you will, there's great variances. If you take insurance for marine risks in the Gulf Coast, drilling rigs and offshore platforms, that sort of thing, those, those prices are up very dramatically, but they should be. I think in the last couple of years, there's been like two and a half billion of premium in the Gulf Coast and 15 billion of losses. So if you paid out 15 billion and took in two and a half billion, 
the more astute of you would figure that you needed a little more money for that particular risk. Um, and I think we will be this year. In fact, I'm almost sure we will be this year. Uh, our mix has changed some. Prices are up a lot. But what we don't know is whether exposures are up even more. Um, we don't know whether the experience of the last two years, we'll say, in the, uh, with hurricanes in this hemisphere is more to be relied upon than the experience of the last hundred years. You can take the hundred year experience and it tells you one thing, and you can take the last couple years and it tells you something else. And which is more meaningful? We don't know the answer to that. We do know that it's be kind of silly to assume that the 100 year experience is, is the relevant uh, criteria when conditions, we know certain atmospheric conditions have changed. We know water temperatures changed, but we don't know all the, we do not know all of the variables that are into the propensity of hurricanes to occur and the degree to, uh, how intense they may be if they do incur. We, we don't know the answer to that. We don't think anybody else knows the answer to it either. So we are getting more money for hurricane insurance. We're getting appreciably more money. If the last two years are the relevant years, we're not getting enough. If the last hundred years are the relevant years, we're getting plenty. And we will know more as time unfolds. The really scary possibility is that variables are changing in some way so that the change is continuous and that what we've seen the last two years is not a worst case example at all. And of course you get into chaos type theory with some of these variables where the outcome is not, not a linear relationship to the input. And, and you, know, you can dream up some pretty scary scenarios on this. I don't know whether they're true and, 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 and nobody uh, knows. We are willing to write uh, certain areas, certain coverages, um, because we believe the prices are adequate and we can sustain the losses. We're, we are willing to lose uh, many billions of dollars in a given catastrophe if we think we've been um, paid appropriately for it. But it is not like figuring out uh, the odds on flipping coins or rolling dice or something like that. You, you are dealing with changing variables and you ha the worst thing you could have would be a hundred year history book uh, in making those judgments. Um, the third quarter we will have a lot of exposure for wind. We don't have as much exposure now. Well, we may. We, uh, we don't have as much exposure now. Well, we may. We, uh, I'd say we're, we're getting there, but we don't have as much, certainly as much as we had a couple of years ago. Uh, prices, questions about prices hardening. The prices are getting, uh, are hardening in that particular area. And if they get to what the, where we really feel they're appropriate, you know, we, we might take on a fair, we will take on a fair amount more risk. Uh, if they don't get there, even though they're higher than last year, we won't write, you know, we're not interested in writing it because it, it's a dangerous business and uh, um, we don't believe in modelers at all. I read all this stuff about modeling. I wrote about that a few years ago. It's silly. You know, the modelers don't know a thing in, in my view about what, what, what's going to happen. Uh, and. We get paid for making guesses on it. If over a lifetime the guesses are 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 uh, decent, we will know that you know we were doing the right thing. But if the, if this year goes by and nothing happens, we still don't know whether we were right on the prices. Because if you get a 25 percent rate for something and it doesn't happen in a year, that does not mean that a 20 you didn't need 40 percent or 50 percent. It just means that if you do it enough times, you will find out whether overall your judgments are any good. It's still a business we like. We bring a lot to the party. Everybody knows we can pay. You got into the question of credit worthiness. If there is some super, super catastrophe, and I regard sort of the outer limits of that being a $250 billion insured loss. For reference, Katrina was a, presently estimated was about a $60 billion loss. So if something comes along that's four times Katrina, which could happen, you know, 
we can pay and we can comfortably pay. We would probably have about 4% of that, maybe 10 billion. A very large percent of the industry would be, would be in very, very serious trouble. So we can play bigger than others and we can survive better than others if something bad comes along. And uh, uh, we will see over a five or 10 year period how we do. You can't judge it by any one year. Charlie. The record of the past, if you average it out, has been quite respectable. And uh, why shouldn't we use our capital strength to get in the volatile stuff that makes other people frightened? Two-part question on the 2005 annual report. Firstly, NetJets is a substantial part of our operations. Unfortunately, its value is obscured by losses in recent years and I can't estimate its value from the report. I was hoping you might be able to help me on that. The second thing, how do I value the Berkshire Hathaway Reinsurance Group in light of the deferred charges on retroactive policies? We have a, an item that's about $2 billion on the asset side. I think I'm addressing the question of deferred charges on retroactive policies. That reflects the fact that those retroactive policies where we insure, we reinsure in effect, the losses somebody has already incurred, although they may not know how much they've incurred. Um, and we have limits on these, but we, we set up a factor that essentially recognizes the fact that we will have that money for a considerable period of time. We set up an asset and that gets amortized over the length of time we have that asset. That, that number, which I think has gotten as high as $3 billion over the years, since we haven't done any of those, any big contracts recently, is down around $2 billion. There's nothing, there's nothing magic about that. It means that we're going to amortize that $2 billion over the lifetime of the use of the funds, and we think we'll make money net during that time. But we missed guest on one a couple of years ago and took a $100 million charge, for example, in the first quarter of... I think it was the year before last. Um, the other question was about NetJets, wasn't it, Charlie? And, but yeah. what, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get it at all. Uh, I, lo I love the Australian accent of our gecko, but I, I didn't pick up the exact nuances of what you asked. But my guess is you asked about, about, the, about the earnings and operation of NetJets. And NetJets has grown rapidly, and so far our expenses have grown faster than our revenue. We have... We've got the top service in the world. Uh, we've got really the only worldwide service. We have a very strong position, particularly in larger airplanes. But I'd have to tell you that, that I did not anticipate. I, I, I thought we would have economies of scale to some degree. And, and so far, you could almost argue that we've had diseconomies of scale. And our expenses, particularly last year, uh, you know, basically got out of hand. And there are various reasons I could give you for that. All I can tell you is it's being addressed. Rich Santulli, who runs that operation, you could not have a better operator. He loves NetJets. He works at it 16 hours a day. He is, he could, there's nobody in the world I would have run that except for Rich. I think it's an important service. It's tough to make money with airplanes. They're capital intensive. We've had fuel do what it has, although that's a pass-through to people, but it still affects the business. And I would, I had expected we would be uh, profitable last year, and as I put in the annual report, I was dead wrong. I think we will be profitable before long, but, but you should take my prediction there with probably with a certain amount of skepticism until it actually happens, because I, like I say, I've been wrong. We've, we've got a good business uh, in that almost anybody looking for a large plane on a fractional jet program comes to us. Uh, we are able to get full price for our service, but there were a variety of inefficiencies last year, which added up to a lot of dollars. And, uh, you know, you're entitled to hold me accountable. Uh, for the fact that we paid a lot of money for the business uh, many years ago, and we haven't earned any money since. And uh, we've got a much bigger business now. 
probably five times or so the size of the business we bought. Uh, maybe some solace. To, I looked at Raytheon's figures the other day. They lost a lot of money, and they have the they have the second largest operation in it. But they sell their they sell airplanes too, so they may not feel it the way I do. Uh, but if I had to bet one way or the other, I would I would I would bet we will be making money before long. But I've lost that bet in the past, Charlie. Yeah, the, the product integrity is so extreme between flight safety, safety and net jets. The pilots are subjected to real oxygen withdrawal in the course of the safety training, so they will recognize the subtle sensation that you get. And not everybody does that. It's an expensive, difficult thing to do. In place after place after place, that system is very obsessive about product integrity. And it's my guess that that obsession in due course will be uh, reward rewarded. Some commodity investors give you as a reference as one of the largest owner of physical silver. Could you please clarify what kind of exposure you or Berkshire currently have in silver? And further, could you please help us to understand how you determine the value of a non-interest bearing precious metal? Do you have any silver on you, Charlie? Um, <laughs> we, we, had a, we had a lot of silver at one time, but we don't have it now. The, uh, the original decision, my decision, was that the production of silver and the reclamation of silver, I don't remember the numbers exactly now, but they were running perhaps 100 million ounces or thereabouts less uh, uh, than the consumption. And now a lot of consumption has gone down in photography, but that's where the reclamation was too, so that those tended more to balance each other out. Uh, I haven't looked at the figures for the last year or so, but, but silver was out of balance. Now, on the other hand, there were enormous quantities of silver above ground, and there were huge quantities of silver that could, could possibly be removed from other uses, perhaps, uh, you know, in, in jewelry and all kinds of things that could conceivably add to supply as they did in the early 1980s when the Hunt Brothers thing took place. But overall, silver was being produced and reclaimed at a, uh, at a lesser rate than it was being consumed. And added to that was the fact that there are relatively few pure silver mines. Silver, mine, silver is largely produced as a byproduct of, of uh, copper and lead and zinc. And, so that it was not easy to bring on added production. So all of that added up to the fact that, that I thought that silver would get tight at some point. And as I said, I was very, I was early in that conclusion and I was early in selling. Uh, so we have no silver now and we did not make much money on it. And you're right that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't earn anything. Uh, uh, so you sit with it. It's not, like, it's not like sitting with a stock where in most cases, uh, earnings are piling up for you. You you have to hope that a you have to hope that a commodity moves in price because it is not producing anything as it sits there looking at you, and that's one of the drawbacks of commodities. Charlie, we we didn't get where we are by owning non-interest bearing commodities. I don't think it's a big issue around here. We actually owned oil at one time too, didn't we? But we didn't make much money out of it. We made a little money. No, you made quite a bit out of oil. Yeah. But yeah. you know, it's a good habit to trumpet your failures and be quiet about your successes. Yeah. Well, we have more to trumpet than we have to be quiet about. <laughs> and I would like to ask if you think it's a good investment strategy to invest in regions of high resources per capita. Uh, in particular, I should like to ask if you think that the analysis per capita should lead to higher growth for businesses in that region, plus the bonus of a relative exchange rate growth. Well, my understanding is he was talking about investing in a region with high resources per capita. Mm. I think he means natural resources. 
Yeah, you think of places like Canada or something of the sort where the... Um, I can clarify, um, yes, high natural resources, but, good, but also good infrastructure. Thank you. And, and whether there'd be relative currency strength in those as well? Uh, no, whether it's a good area for us to be operating in. Well, that, that would be a little, a little macro for us. Uh, we, really, we really just zero in on, you know, whether people will keep eating candy and, and uh, whether we can charge a little more for it next year. Uh, the, we don't play big trends. You know, we, we don't think about de demographic trends or anything of the sort. That, uh, we think about our own ages getting older, but, uh, but other uh, big trends, they just don't mean that much. There's, there's too much money to be made from year to year to think about things that take decades to manifest themselves. So I can't recall of a, I can't recall of a, a decision we've ever made on a purchase of a business or a stock uh, or a junk bond or a currency or anything else based on, uh, on a macro. Or Not only that, we've recently failed to profit much from one of the biggest commodity booms in history. And we'll probably continue to fail in the same way. But we'll search for new ways to fail. I mean, we're not trying to limit us. <laughs> it's probably true, incidentally, in a country like Canada, where you've got probably millions of barrels of oil, of, uh, of millions of barrels a day of oil uh, production coming on, and where there's you know relatively few people. Uh, and where there's already a, a, a surplus, run, they're running a significant current account surplus that, you know, that it's not strange that their currency should be strong relative to a country like ours where we're running a huge current account deficit and we don't have that same uh, natural, the, the gain in, in natural exports coming on that they do. But that, there's so many more important factors that are going to hit us immediately that that's that's what we really think about day to day. I'm an optimistic person, and I'm sure it would be more enjoyable to discuss the Chicago Cubs' march to the World Series. You are optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody has a bad century now and then, as somebody said about the Cubs. <laughs> as an investor, I want to know how to address the risk of nuclear terrorism in the United States what would happen to our economy? How would it respond? How resilient would it be? Well, it would certainly depend on the extent of it, but if you're asking how to profit from that, I, there's probably some dealer that will sell you mortality derivatives, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's what we, we, we would be thinking about that. No, I, I, I agree with you, Norm. I, I couldn't agree with you more about that being the ultimate problem of mankind, not necessarily a terrorist type usage, but a, a state-sponsored usage of, of weapons of mass destruction, and it will happen someday. The extent to which it will happen, where it will happen, who knows, but, but we have always had evil people. We've always had people who wish evil on others, and, you know, thousands of years ago, if you were psychotic or a religious fanatic or a malcontent and you wished evil on your neighbor, you picked up a rock and threw it at them, and that was about the damage you could do, but we went on to bows and arrows and cannons and a few things. But since 1945, it's the, the potential for inflicting enormous harm on incredible numbers of people has increased, you know, at a geometric pace. So it is, it is the problem of, of mankind. It may happen here. It may happen someplace else. People say it's a, sometimes they say, well, you know, if we solve poverty, we'd solve this. Well, I would just remind you that Nuclear weapons have only been used twice, and those were by the richest country in the in the world, the United States, in 1945. So, people will justify their use under some circumstances if they feel threatened. They will justify them for religious reasons. They will do all kinds of crazy things, and the what holds it in check is the degree to which the lack of knowledge of how to do it is, 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 is controlled and the degree to which the materials are controlled and which the deliverability is, 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 is circumscribed. And we're losing ground on all of those fronts. 
the knowledge is more widespread. You know, the possibility of getting your hands on materials, you know, the Dr. Khans of the world and so on, has increased and it, it will be, <clears throat> it's a real problem, but we won't be thinking about uh, what Berkshire did that day in the, in the stock market. And uh, I don't know, um, I, don't, I don't know how money attacks that. I mean, I've always saw that as the top priority, I think, should be the top priority for a philanthropy in my particular case, but it's a diff it's a very difficult, it's a, it's a worst case problem. You know, you have six billion people in the world and have a certain percentage of them who are one way or another a little crazy or very crazy and some of whom, and that craziness would manifest itself by, by trying to do great harm to a lot of people. And it's uh, only one of them has to succeed. I don't know how many we've intercepted over the years. I'm sure we've intercepted a lot of in incipient ones, but, but it, it is a worst case problem and, and one will succeed at some point. And it may be state sponsored, it may be terrorist, but you know, Berkshire, it's better set to survive than anybody else, but it won't make much difference. Charlie? Well, I think that the chances we'll have another 60 or 70 years with no nuclear devices used on purpose is pretty close to zero. So I think you're right to worry about it, but I don't myself I think there's much that any of us can do about it except to be as sensible as we can and take the consequences as they come. The only thing you can do about it, but you only have one vote, is to elect leaders who are terribly conscious of the product and uh, problem and uh, who uh, devote a significant you know, part of their thought and energy into minimizing it. You, you can't eliminate it. You know, the genie is out of the bottle. and, and uh, uh, you would like to have the leading, the leaders of the major countries of the world regarding it as their primary, as a primary focus. Actually, in the in the 2004 campaign, I think that that both candidates said it was the major problem of of our time. But but um, you know they they probably suffer from the same feeling that I do that it's very hard to address. Last year, you bought stock in some great businesses trading at fair prices, such as Walmart and Budweiser, but did not attempt to buy our own shares. Would shareholders be correct to infer from this decision that you both felt Walmart and Budweiser were trading at a deeper discount to their intrinsic values than Berkshire was? And would it be possible to buy as much Berkshire in the open market as you did Walmart without running up the share price? Most of the time we would not be able to buy an amount that would be material in terms of, of the, uh, increasing the value of the remaining Berkshire shares. But that doesn't mean it would never happen. But it, if you look at the trading volume on, on Berkshire and Mark, you might put that up if, if we can in a second. Uh, we probably have less opportunity than most companies if our stock is selling, should be selling below intrinsic value to have anything meaningful happen. We would also have, if we regarded some other company as worth X, a good business, and we could buy it at 90% of X, we might be doing that now, whereas we wouldn't have done it many years ago. But we might require a somewhat greater margin in terms of buying Berkshire shares simply because our view on that might be less we probably have more knowledge on it, but we might be less objective than on some other things. We think that if we were to buy in Berkshire shares, and if you remember four or five years ago, I announced we would if the price stayed the same, that the case ought to really be compelling. Now, if it's compelling, we ought to do it. It was compelling at that time, but simply the act of writing about it, you know, it's a little bit of the Heisenberg principle, the act of writing about it, in effect, eliminated the opportunity to do it, which is fine, because we do not, we are not looking to make money off of buying from shareholders at a depressed price. On the other hand, if the price is sufficiently depressed, we will announce again that we intend to do it, and then we'll see whether we actually get a chance to do it. Yeah, the whole climate in the country is different now. It used to be that almost every company that bought in shares was buying the man at an obvious bargain price. 
Now I think a lot of share buying is designed to sort of prop the stock price. In other words, it's not bargain seeking, it's, it's more like Sam Insel. Yeah, 40 years ago, 30, 30 years ago, it was a very fertile field for making money to look at companies that were aggressively buying in their shares. The most extreme case probably would be Teledyne. But those people were buying overwhelmingly. Gordon Wallace was doing it at, at, at the companies he controlled. Those people were motivated simply by the fact they wanted to buy the stock. That motivation has been swamped by people who either think it's fashionable to buy in shares or by people who really like the idea of trying to prop their stock up somewhat. And the, rule, the SEC has certain rules in terms of your, the way you conduct your repurchases to prevent daily sort of propping up. But I think, I think there's a lot of motivation that our stock has got to be cheaper than other people's stock and we've got a wonderful company and so we're just going to buy the stock come hell or high water. And uh, that is not the way we would go about repurchasing shares. Some figures that show the turnover of Berkshire shares compared with a few others I picked out. I think Berkshire has the lowest turnover by some margin of any major company in the, in the, in the United States. Uh, and I put Walmart up there because the Walton family owns about the same, in fact, they own more of, 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 uh, of Walmart than, than I do of Berkshire. So this is not a function of simply the fact that we've got concentrated holdings with the Buffett family. This is a reflection of the fact that we've got a really unusual shareholder body in that they think of themselves as owners and not of people who are moving around with little pieces of paper every, every week or month. We have the most, in my view, what I would call honest to God ownership attitude among our 400,000 or so shareholders of any company, of any big traded company in the United States. We people, people buy Berkshire to own it and hold it. And uh, that's reflected in our turnover. That does mean if for some reason the stock gets cheap, real cheap, that we will not be able to buy a lot of stock in, but we, we don't want, we are not, we're not looking to buy out our partners at a discount. If it sells there and we tell them we're going to buy it, we'll buy it. But, but that's not, that's not a way that we're trying to make money. I could be classified as one of those helpers you describe in your annual report. In fact, most of my friends are helpers and some could be classified as super helpers. Most would love to step out and uh, explore some of their more innovative ideas, innovative business models, strategies, and things of that nature. But at the risk of giving up a significant salary, health insurance, flights, all the ridiculous corporate perks that some of us young professionals earn, what advice would you have in us into pursuing those dreams? Well, there's certainly a lot more helpers in the economy than there used to be. And the ones that come here tend to be the very best of the helper class. So I don't think you should judge the helper class by those you meet here. We get the best of them. And uh, as to what the young helpers ought to do so that they'll eventually be like Warren Buffett, I would say the best thing you can do is reduce your expectations. I think I've heard that before. <laughs> well, it is, you know, as I wrote about, and I'm trying to tweak the system a little bit, but the, it is an interesting business in that the, the activities of the professionals are self-neutralizing. And if you're going to, if your wife is going to have a baby, you're going to be better off if you call an obstetrician probably than if you do it yourself. You know, and if, you're the, if your plumbing pipes are clogged or something, you're probably better off calling a plumber. Uh, most professions have value added to them above what the layman can accomplish themselves. In aggregate, the investment profession does not do that. So you have a huge group of people making, I, I put the estimate as $140 billion a year, that in aggregate are and can only accomplish what somebody can do, are and can only accomplish what somebody can do, you know, in 10 minutes a year uh, uh, by themselves. And 
It's hard to think of another business like that, Charlie. Can you, you, the, the, I can't think of any. No. Um, but it's become a bigger and bigger business. And uh, as I've pointed out in the report, the main thing uh, that's been learned is that if the more you charge, uh, at least temporarily, the more money you bring in. Uh, that people have this idea that price equals value. Uh, it's useful to get into a business like that. Sometimes I'm, if I'm talking to the people at a business school, you know, I ask them what the, what a great, to name me a great business. And of course, one of the great businesses is a business school because basically the more you charge, the more your prestige is to some extent. And, and people think that a business school that charges 50,000 a year of tuition is going to be better than one charges 10,000 a year of tuition. So uh, there's some of that that, well, there's a lot of it that's gotten into the investment field recently. And you now have large, uh, certain large portions of investment management that are charging fees that in aggregate cannot work out for investors. Now, obviously some do, you know, but, but uh, you cannot be paying people 2% and 20% where they get it in the good years and they fold their partnerships and start another one if, if they have a bad year and that sort of thing. You, you can't have that coming out of a, an economy that's only going to produce, we'll say, you know, 7% or something like that a year for investors and have people net better off. It isn't going to work. And then the question that you will have is how do I pick out the few exceptions? And everyone that calls upon you to sell you this will tell you that they are an exception. And uh, I am willing to bet uh, a significant sum of money, it will put it up, uh, to anybody who wants to name 10 partnerships that are $500 million or more of management and, and pit those after fees against the S&P over a 10-year period. And, uh, uh, you know, it gets away from the survivorship bias and all that kind of thing. But we, and it isn't going to happen. But a few will, a few will do well. They're bound to do well. And, uh, you know, I just, and, I, and actually, I think I do know how to pick a few that will do well. I mean, I, I did it in the past when I wound up my own partnership in 19, 1969. I told people to go to either Bill Ruin or Sandy Gottesman. And that would have been a very good uh, decision, which, whichever place they went. So if you know enough about the person, know enough how they've done it in the past, know enough about their personality and honesty and a whole bunch of things, I think that occasionally you can make a very intelligent choice in picking an investment manager. But I don't think you can do it if you're sitting, running a pension fund in some state and you have 50 people calling on you. You're going to, you're going to go with the ones that are the best salespeople and not the ones that are the best investors. Charlie? Well, yeah, on that state pension fund investment subject, I think it ought to be a crime to entertain in any way a state pension fund official, and I think it ought to be a crime if you are a state pension fund official to accept the entertainment. It's not a pretty scene, a lot of investment management in America now. And human nature being what it is and the amounts of money being what they are, I don't think much is going to be improved. Well, we wanted to leave you in a good mood for lunch. So <laughs> we will break now and we'll come back in about 45 minutes or so. If illegal immigration reform were to occur, how would you see this affecting Shaw, Clayton, and other Berkshire subsidiaries? Yeah, I, I didn't read that, and I don't know much about the Mohawk situation. Uh, I, I, know, I don't know anything about it. I'm, there, I'm sure in Nebraska, uh, you know, there are very substantial numbers of illegal immigrants employed. They, they, uh, Meatpacking has been an area that, that, that uh, a number have gone into. And I actually was down at the Omaha airport about two years ago, and then there was a very large plane there. Uh, and I saw these well over 100 people that were in shackles that were being put on that plane. I, 
kind of wondered what they did if they ever had an, a, some kind of an emergency on the plane, but they were being deported. So there's a lot of it that goes on in Nebraska. Um, you know, I think it's a problem that should be addressed and addressed promptly. I don't believe in shipping 11 million people back away from the United States at uh, whatever acceptable way that the c country can handle giving those people citizenship. I basically uh, would support. I think we ought to enforce the rules in the future. I think there ought to be li liberal rules, but I think they ought to be enforced. Uh, but I don't think it would make dramatic differences. I mean, if one meatpacking plant employs people at, at subpar rate wages, you know, the rest of them are going to do the same thing. You may end up paying a little bit more for meat in the end. Uh, but I, I do not think it would have a dramatic effect on the economy or even on specific industries, uh, except to change maybe relative prices a bit. But I don't think it would have a dramatic effect uh, on the economy if the people that are uh, here illegally became legal in, in some manner. Uh, you know, I, who's to say if Charlie and I had been born into some terrible situation in some other country, we wouldn't have tried to get into this place ourselves. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty empathetic with it, but I believe that we do need to have laws that are enforced in the future. I don't think we should send 11 million people back. Charlie? If you don't like the results, I think you should get used to it because we never seem to have the will to enforce the immigration laws. I just think that what you've seen is what you're going to get. I don't, I, in terms of the carpet industry specifically, uh, you mentioned Clayton Holmes. I wouldn't, I would think uh, in the mobile manufactured house, housing industry, I'd be, I'd be surprised if there was any unusual number at all of illegal immigrants. But I, the answer is I don't know that for sure. And, uh, but I don't, I don't see any change in those industries. Uh, uh, number nine. Hi, Warren. Hi, Charlie. My name is Jeremy Cleaver, and I come from Lawrence, Kansas. I'm a Jayhawk, and what do you believe is the best finance program in the U.S.? Also, <laughs> I, will I will be graduating in a year. Could you compare and contrast the financing opportunities now and when you graduated college? Uh, he comes from a school that has sent some classes up in the last couple of years. They're absolutely terrific. They're, I've had, I will have in this school year cl probably close to 40 schools where the students come out and now I usually double up schools because 20 of these a year is about all I can handle. Uh, and we've had some terrific groups come out and I would say that the teaching and finance departments, uh, based on what I've seen, has improved quite a bit over 20 years ago, but that was from a very, very low base. Uh, the, uh, the orthodoxy of 20 or so years ago uh, were really, uh, you know, the, the flat earth was being embraced, uh, has, has improved considerably. And, and one particular place is at KU, Professor Hershey, done a great job. Uh, Missouri, Florida, Columbia, uh, a lot of good schools. Stanford uh, have got people in those departments that uh, are doing a very good job. But 25 years ago, you'd have had a tough job getting a position in the finance department, and you certainly would have had your advancement uh, stifled unless you went along with the orthodoxy, efficient markets and modern portfolio theory and a lot of stuff that not only wouldn't do you any good but might get you in trouble. And that has, that's improved a lot. And I enjoy seeing these groups of students as they come out because it's, uh, it's quite encouraging. Now, they all think they're going to get rich by sort of copying what Charlie and I did many, many years ago. 
Uh, I wish him well. It's uh, I, the, the amount of brain power going into money management gets a little distressing, particularly to, to Charlie. But I would, you know, it, it's a great time to be 22 or 23 or 25 and getting out of school. So I, I, you, know, you, you can look ahead to a very, I think, a, 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 a very interesting future in this country, even though you may find that the method of using the talents you have in investing uh, get used in a somewhat different manner than than where they where they're used presently. I mean, right right now, an awful lot of the uh, students that come to visit Omaha, say private equity or hedge fund, and uh, it's hard to imagine a world where everybody's running a running a hedge fund. I'm not sure exactly what we would do for food and clothing and a few things like that. But, uh, but I, I, I am encouraged by the kind of students I meet. It, 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 and when the KU group comes up, we had a great time. They put on various skits. They try to sell me companies. I'm hoping they succeed. Uh, we haven't had any luck with yet, but, but they keep coming up with good ideas, and I'll keep pursuing them. And one of these days, every one of those students will get. I've offered them two B shares. And it's a limited time offer to try and spur extra activity. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, uh, I hear from a lot of students la later, and I think a lot of them have their heads screwed down right. Charlie? Well, I've heard that something like half of the business school graduates and the elite Eastern schools want to go into uh, private equity or hedge funds. And uh, those whom I bump into seem to judge their progress in life as to whether or not they're keeping up with their age cohort at Goldman Sachs. That appears to be the minimum standard by which progress in life is measured. And this can't possibly end well. You can see in why they come to come In they, terms of uh, satisfying all these expectations. That's why they come to see me instead of Charlie. <laughs> He'd give them better advice, don't, don't misunderstand me, but. I have no concern about the next CEO of Berkshire Hathaway to take this company forward, but I do wonder about this phone. It may not ring as often as it does now. I don't think there's any question but that, that my successor, uh, you know, will go through sort of a, a, uh, a media probation type uh, affair for a year or so, and, and, and people will understandably wonder whether the culture uh, is going to be different under the successor than it, it's been at this point. Uh, that's that's going to happen. Uh, it won't be the end of the world. It will mean that the phone will. It, the phone probably won't ring less. It'll just be a different different kind of suitor that is calling. And the, the investment bankers will all try out this guy to see if he's softer than I am, and. Uh, wants to participate in auctions and all of that sort of thing, but I think it will become evident, and it'll take it'll take a year, two years maybe. I think it'll become evident that the culture is the same, that the yardsticks, the metrics, the attitude towards shareholders, the whole thing will not change. The board will not change, and um, but I think there will be a hiatus of sorts where people do not have the same feeling immediately that, that joining Berkshire is, is going to be the same experience as it, with their companies as it's been in, in, in the past. But it won't last long. I can tell you the successors that the board has in mind, uh, you know, they're very smart. They understand. They bought in to uh, uh, the whole corporate personality we have. And they will develop, be somewhat different uh, in style, but they will, they'll, they will develop uh, the confidence of the world that, and, and a possible seller, uh, the confidence of the world that, and, and a possible sellers of businesses, they will, of businesses, they will develop the confidence that, that it's going to be the same Berkshire uh, going forward. But it's a good question, and there will be there will be a period uh, 
uh, when the when the phone won't ring for a while, so people realize that that Berkshire is sort of one of a kind, and it's continuing to be one of a kind. I don't think it would work well, you know. But it's it's the kind of thing we talk about with the board. Level. But I don't think it works well to have sort of a half and half arrangement. I mean, you could say that that I could handle or encourage the handling of the deals, and somebody else could sort of be the operating guy. But the truth is, we don't need an operating guy. You know, we've got we've got people running the businesses that are running them, and they're very good at it. And the the main thing to do is to not destroy uh, or, or or damage the spirit they bring to it, and the fact that they like this method of operation. That so it would. I'm not sure what uh, a chief operating officer uh, would do at Berkshire, except expose the fact that I wasn't doing anything. You know, <laughs> and, the, and and as long as I'm around, they're not going to get the calls on the deals. I mean, people are going to want to talk to me. And I mean, that's that's not a handoff that would work. So I I think we'll go along in this in this mode, um, and you know, you will have a period. Everybody, there will be stories a year after I die that you know says one year later and what's happened and all that sort of thing, but that will fade out, and. My successor will put his own particular stamp on the place, but he won't mess with the culture. And uh, they're too smart. They've seen it work too well. Um, so that the calls will start coming in again uh, after a while. We will still represent sort of a one-of-a-kind place for the owner that really cares about the future of his business. For one reason or another, tax reasons, Family division of shares or something, you know they have to they have to solve the ownership problem, but they want to solve it in a way that really doesn't change the psychic ownership of the place and the management of the place. And they can't find that elsewhere, and they'll continue to find it at Berkshire. Charlie. Well, speaking for the Munger heirs, I would rather the current method of operation continue to wring the last drop of good out of Warren. <laughs> At low pay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Part of part of Charlie's instructions under all circumstances. Now, if we if we, if, we, if there, we thought there was some better way to make this place function better, or to even make the transition easier to the next person, you know, we'd be delighted. But I, I think I think it's I really think it's going to work. Uh, pretty darn well. If, if, if I die tonight, the person who will take over tomorrow will not get as many phone calls for a while, perhaps. But very, very smart people know the business. You know, they know a lot about all businesses. They got a general business knowledge. I use they because there's three candidates, but there would be one specific one of mine. They know how to make deals. I mean, these are, these people are, are plenty deal savvy. And they know how to avoid other kinds of deals, which is equally important. And the world would not fully grasp that for a year, maybe even two years. But, but once it happened, you can argue that it would be even stronger than before, because at that point, people would realize that it was institutionalized and not just a person. I mean, you, you had a kind of a hat. I mean, I don't want to compare myself because it's not in the same league, but but, you know, everybody, when Sam Walton died and I think, what, 1991 or something, they wondered whether Walmart would continue in the same tradition. Well, you know, the fact that it did has, has made that place a lot stronger than if it had just depended on the, on the guy in the pickup truck. I mean, it was not, it was the creation of one person at Walmart, but it was not required for the continuation at all. And uh, it, we're not in the same league, but, but it's, the, it's the same idea. Would you please help us think through the capital allocation decisions we face when it comes to charitable giving, particularly as it concerns how we pick effective charities? Well, it's tough to give other people advice on that, but uh, you know you have to pick the things that are important to you. And you know many people, majority in the United States, it's their church. You know there's more money given to churches than anything else. Many, pe very many people, it's 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 their school or schools generally. Um, 
you know, I think to a great extent, you should pick whatever gives you the most satisfaction. And that will probably be something that you know, something you maybe benefited from yourself. I look at it a little differently. The amount of funds are different too, but I, I like to think of, of things that are important, but that don't have natural funding constituencies. But that isn't something, you know, for millions of people to be following as an example or something. Uh, nothing wrong with doing something that gives you plenty of personal satisfaction and does some good for other people in the process. So I would, I would, I would not be reluctant. I would not feel I had to be as objective about that necessarily as I was about about buying securities or, or, or something of the sort. I would, I would, I would kind of go where my gut led me and, and uh, uh, make it something you participate in. Like I say, I think if you're doing it with large sums, you may have some reason, maybe even some obligation to try and think about where really large sums can have an important impact on a societal problem that might not get attention otherwise. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's sort of where my own thinking leads me, but I would, I, would, uh, I, I would go with something where I felt I knew where the money was going to go and I knew some good was gonna come out of it and maybe by observing uh, what took place, I could make the next gift more efficient than the last gift and, and more beneficial. Charlie? I've got nothing to add, but I have a question. Would you pour me a cup of coffee? <laughs> We don't sell coffee, Charlie. We sell Coke. <laughs> we get the profit on one out of every 12 Cokes. So I don't care whether you drink them, just open the can. <laughs> Did the possible future deployment of telecommunications services over power lines factor into Berkshire's decision to invest in the utility space? Thank you. Yeah, the answer is, is, is no. Uh, we're in uh, the utility business, the regulated utility business, because we like the business as is. Where it leads, uh, you know, will be determined, uh, well, in specific states by what they want us to do uh, and, and maybe by technological changes generally. But we're going to earn a return on capital employed uh, if we do a, an efficient job, keep consumers happy, uh, whether we transmit it the old way or, you know, or some new processes come along. So it's, it's a business where we're trying to be efficient, which means serving our customers while keeping their costs down as much as possible. And uh, we will, even in terms of what generating sources we use, we are following the will of the people in the states in which we operate. I mean, if, if, if there are different costs associated with different forms of generation, and we feel that if people want to elect a more expensive way to generate electricity, but one that they're more comfortable with in terms of the environment, you know, that, that's, that's the decision of the people of the state in which we operate. And we're, um, so I, I do not see us, uh, I, I don't see any large developments that change the economics of what we're doing. And we're, we're certainly not going in, we're not buying a, an electric utility because we expect to uh, generate revenues from activities other than that. Do you think that the nature of newspapers, magazine, television, and uh, maybe movie and music business are about to change permanently and become less uh, predictive bill. Well, people are always going to want to be entertained and they're going to want to be informed and some mix thereof. But, you know, we only have two eyeballs and we only have 24 hours a day. So if you go back 50 or 60 years and think about how people got informed or entertained then, the choices were far fewer. You had the local movie theater and you had the radio and you had newspapers. And as the years have gone by, what technology has done is opened up a huge variety of ways of being informed faster, certainly. And whether it's better or not depends on who you ask. And 
certainly entertained in way many more forms, many that are free, and it hasn't expanded the time you have for entertainment uh, or for acquiring knowledge. And, and uh, any time you get more and more people competing uh, in any given area, generally the economics deteriorate. And the economics have deteriorated for newspapers, although they're still enormously profitable in relation to tangible equity employed, but they do not have the same economic prospects if you look at the future stream of earnings that it looked like they had 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. And television, again, the, the, the margins have been maintained surprisingly well, but the audience keeps going down and uh, for any given uh, means of distribution. So that has to erode economics over time. Cable was thought to operate pretty much all by itself and the telecoms come in and very few businesses get better because of more competition. They like to talk about it, you know, they, but, but it, it, you know, their idea, I, I had one friend in the newspaper business and I think Charlie used to tease her a bit by saying that her idea of a competitor was, was a corpse laid out on a slab with a toe twitching, you know, and then uh, the, it, it, it is not a better business when more people compete. So I think that generally speaking, the economics of media uh, businesses uh, do not have a great outlook. I mean, compared, uh, like I say, they're enormously profitable now in returns on tangible assets. I mean, it, it's a business, you know, a license from the federal government became a royalty stream uh, on huge amounts of money. I mean, there were only three highways between electronic highways between Procter and Gamble and Ford Motor and the eyeballs of several hundred million people. And those three highways could make a lot of money when there were only three highways. But you keep building more ways to, for the P&Gs or the, or, or, or the Gillettes or whomever it might be, or Ford Motor or General Motors, to get to those eyeballs and you decrease the value of the highways. It's not complicated. So I, I think you will see, it's hard to imagine those businesses having great prospects in aggregate. Uh, we owned the World Book. We still own the World Book. We were selling 300,000 sets a year or something like that in the mid 80s. Uh, it's a very valuable product. It sold for $600 or thereabouts and it was worth it. Uh, but the problem became that you could get that same information, or a good bit of the same information, you know, very, very cheap through the internet. And you didn't have to cut down trees and you didn't have to run paper mills and you didn't have to hire United Parcel Service to deliver a very bulky package. And, and uh, it isn't that the product we, we have isn't worth the money, it's that people have lots of other alternatives. And that's true in information and, and entertainment in a big, big way, and it won't stop, in my view. Charlie? Yeah, it's simplicity itself. It'll be a rare business that doesn't have a way worse future than it had a past. Give them the bad news, Charlie. <laughs> thing to do was to, to buy the NFL originally or something like that. I mean, you know, there, there still is only, you know, there are certain primary events, but it's the, the people who transmit them, there's more ways to transmit those events, and so the, the value gets extracted in a, in a, in a much different way. Have, previously, you have held uh, uh, very strong views about the dollar, but what are your views now? And are you capitalizing on your views on the currency? Yeah, well, my views, and Charlie may disagree, but my, my views are as strong as ever, perhaps a bit stronger. The, uh, uh, we are doing less directly in, 
in currency futures because the, as I explained in the annual report, the carry cost has gone from being positive to quite negative. So there are better ways, in my view, uh, considerably better ways of, of mitigating the consequences of, 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 of the dollar becoming a lot weaker in the future. We like the idea of developing earning power in other currencies around the world, and, and in fact, in, in ISTAR itself, the, the ISTAR itself, the, the um, a, a large portion of the earnings are, are not in dollars, and, and we're doing it in other areas as well. We'll, we will hold less in currency futures unless the carry uh, picture changes. But the fundamental picture, what in my view is almost, you never say certain, but it, it, a very high probability of happening is that the U.S. currency uh, weakens over time. Uh, no idea about the next six months or a year or anything, but over, over a long period of time, weakens against other currencies because we are following policies that don't seem much don't seem to leave much alternative. Um, here is a quote referring to referring to running a large current account deficit that was given on February 28, 2002. The quote is countries that have gone down this path invariably have run into trouble and so would we. Eventually the current account deficit will have to be restrained. Now that was said by a very smart fellow whose name was Alan Greenspan. And at that time, the current account deficit was 385 billion and it'll be more than double that now. So here, four years later, we have gone down that path, uh, which he talked about, and we've gone faster and faster down the path. And he says, invariably, it runs into trouble. Now, in his la later years as Fed chairman, he did not emphasize this view as much. Uh, he, he never repudiated it, but he, he sort of talked about other things more. Um, but it, it's going to lead to something. And it, 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 in my view, it's likely to be something significant. And people talk about a soft landing, but they never explain to me exactly how it's going to take place. And Chairman Bernanke recently gave a talk where he said the probabilities were that the ending would be good, but that the, you couldn't rule out the possibility otherwise. Uh, I think you will see significant consequences at some point. We will have at Berkshire a fair amount of our earning power coming from uh, other countries with other currencies, but we will always be primarily in the United States. And, and uh, uh, you know, we, we may, one consequence certainly seems possible is significantly higher inflation as the years go by, because as you owe more and more money as a country, it gets more and more tempting to devalue what you owe by paying in a cheaper currency than, than in the one in which the debts were incurred. Uh, Charlie, what do you have to say on this? Well, I don't feel I have any special capacity to predict whether the euro was exactly priced right right now. I don't consider it a big deal that Berkshire has had the position it's had. In effect, about half of our surplus cash was stashed short term in currencies other than the dollar. I regard that as almost a non-event. Now, as it well, happened, I made a couple billion dollars. Yes, though. <laughs> I, I, I was to say, as I was, I was about to say that as it's happened so far, it's been a very profitable. Uh, non-event, but <laughs> if, it if it doesn't mean anything to, to him, he can always give his share to me. But yeah. <laughs> Generally speaking, it can't be good to be running a big current account deficit and a big fiscal de deficit and to have them both growing. I mean, a great civilization may be able to stand something like that for a way longer period than uh, you might have thought at the outset. But you'd think that in the end, there would be a comeuppance and that we would have to uh, change policies, perhaps 
perhaps painfully. In fact, I would say almost surely painfully, wouldn't you, Warren? Yeah, I, I would. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because I, I think almost everybody says it's unsustainable. And then they never explain how it, it doesn't keep being sustained <laughs> until something very unpleasant comes along. But then they also say that there will be a soft landing. And I don't always get from A to B to C when I listen to them. Uh, the, certainly the longer it goes on, the greater the, credit, the greater the net debtor position the United States is in, the more people see that we are sort of addicted to this kind of behavior, the more chance there is at some point, probably brought about by some other extraneous affair, that currency doesn't, there aren't some big adjustments that take place and, and, and perhaps some chaotic markets in which currency adjustments play a part. Um, but as knowing when or exactly how, it's impossible to say that sort of thing, that, uh, to predict that sort of thing. Uh, Charlie and I in the 1980s saw something called portfolio insurance, and that was a very popular term then, uh, catch on with institutions. And what happened was that a group was around selling the idea that this was a a sophisticated, superior way for large institutions to manage money. And uh, they charged appreciable sums to, pe for people, to, to people to set up me mechanistic procedures for dealing with stock market fluctuations. They did it with pension funds and various big guys. And, and it was very popular and the academic literature was full of it. And people were teaching about it in the schools. And then October 19th, 1987 came along, and a relatively small portion of American money, invest American investments, were being guided by this portfolio insurance uh, doctrine. But just that small amount of money was a, the leading factor in producing a 22% change in the value of American stocks in one day. Uh, Every one of these people individually thought what they were doing was intelligent, but when aggregated and, and having to follow a given signal, in effect, you created a doomsday machine. It was out of control, and some really chaotic things happened then. I would say the potential for that sort of thing, not that exact thing at all, but that sort of thing to happen in, in, the, in the world ahead is, is it's probably magnified quite a bit from what existed in the 80s, and currency enters into it. But it's not, who knows where it starts or exactly why somebody yells fire, but when, when, when fire is yelled, there will be, the currency markets will play a part in the rush for the door. Do you believe that this, the, the consumer price index is a good and true and accurate measure of inflation? Well, that's a good question. It, it, Bill Gross has written a little bit about that in some of his PIMCO methods and messages. And, uh, you know, if you go out to the furniture mart and, and construct a price index, it hasn't moved very much. I mean, it makes it very tough for comparable store sales when you were selling DVD players at X a few years ago, and now you're selling them at a quarter of X. So there's, there's certain areas that, that there's been a huge uh, in effect, deflationary aspects. But I do think the CPI, and, and like I say, Gross has written about this, but the CPI is, is not particularly a uh, good index. I, I always get a kick out of when they talk about the core CPI and then they, then they say that excludes food and energy. I'm, you know, food and energy strike me as pretty core to anything in terms of the average price. I can't think of anything as much more core. Uh, the CPI, as you may or may not know, many, many years ago, had housing figured in directly, there is no, the CPI, CPI now has a rental, which is an imputed rental type computation. It's still a large portion of the CPI, but it does not reflect the new housing prices or, uh, uh, and, and rentals, the rental factor has lagged, in my view, significantly below uh, what housing costs really are for an American family uh, and, and 
Um, since housing is a big portion, I don't think it picks it up well. So I would say that the CPI has understated inflation for a great many people. Now, if you're older and you own your own house, I mean, everybody has their own way of living. And, and I mean, if all you do is drink Coca-Cola all day, you know, Coca-Cola hasn't gone up in price enough, in, in my view. And <laughs> you, <coughs> my CPI has not changed very much. But for somebody buying a new house versus six or eight years ago and, and driving 30 or 40 miles to work or, or having a lot of driving in the family, the CPI has gone up a lot more than, than uh, the government figures would indicate. Charlie? Yeah, I see it at Costco where there's been almost no inflation in the, in the composite product that flows through Costco. And yet in other places you get these dramatic rising figures. I don't feel sorry for the people that pay $27 million for an 8,000-foot condo in Manhattan. You know, if they've had little inflation, I guess it doesn't matter to the rest of us. But it's almost weird the way the situation works in terms of how it's, yeah. it comes in just a few places. If you, if you look at the Costco annual report or the Walmart annual report, these are huge enterprises. And you'll see their LIFO adjustment is, is just peanuts. And Almost nothing. Yeah, just peanuts. Is, is, is Costco on LIFO for, sure. for, for fuel? Oh, I know they're on LIFO generally. Are they on it for gasoline or not? But, um, I they, think so. I yeah. can't imagine they're not. Yeah, but they wouldn't have a large inventory relative to no. their sales volume. But the at Walmart, it's inconsequential. I just got through reading their annual report. And uh, the LIFO adjustment isn't worth a hiccup, you know, basically. And... You were dealing with 300 billion, well, in the United States, a little less than that, but 200 and some billion dollars worth of sales. And the LIFO adjustment would have picked up changes in prices of that mix overall relative to their inventory level. So in jewelry, you know, because of gold and some things, we had some big LIFO adjustments last year. Steel, we've had big LIFO adjustments. We have a steel service center in Chicago, and we, we buy a lot of steel at, at MyTech. And there's a big LIFO adjustment, so it's very uneven. Carpet went no place for 20 years, but because it's petrochemical based, uh, there have been substantial price changes in, in the carpet business in the last couple of years. And our LIFO, we had a, a LIFO, a net, a minus LIFO figure in effect three years ago, and now we have a hundred million or so of LIFO adjustments. So there's been a significant price change there. I think overall though, for a typical young family, that that the CPA probably underestimates the burden they have faced in terms of their own living situation. Number four. Hi, I'm Mike Kelly from Iowa City. Um, we've heard a bit about ISCAR today. Could you tell us uh, some things about some of the other acquisitions of the past year? What would you like to know, Mike? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, we described them a bit in the annual report, but... Right. Uh, well, uh, I believe since the annual report, there have been uh, a couple of others. Um, Russell, for instance. Uh, yeah, Russell is in the works. There's just been a proxy statement <coughs> that isn't out yet, but it's been filed with the SEC. You can get a copy of the filing. But, but that, that is one in process. Uh, and is probably a, a couple of months off uh, from actual completion. You know, we, I described the business wire situation uh, in the annual report where uh, I got a letter from uh, Kathy uh, after reading, reading uh, a Wall Street Journal article. And, uh, you know, these, they just all sort of pop up. Medical protective, uh, I think I suggested to Jeff ML, the GE, that if I knew they were interested in doing things with their insurance assets, and I suggested that was one portion of their insurance assets that Berkshire would have an interest in, and he and I met one time, and we made a deal on that one. Um, Pacific Corp, I'm not, that originated with, with, with uh, Dave Sokol and the people at Scottish Power, I'm not even exactly sure what the sequence was, but the one thing we haven't done 
as we haven't we haven't participated in any auctions. Uh, I get books occasionally I get, on on various businesses, and the projections are just plain silly in these books. I mean, it's it, 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 I would I would I, I, maybe that's why they don't sign their names in the books. The people that write them because they're, they'd be embarrassed about the projections they put forth. Uh, I would just love to meet the people that write those investment banking books and make them a bet on the earnings that they project four years out. I would win a lot of money over time. <laughs> they wouldn't be met. But we, we get the calls occasionally from the people that care about where their businesses end up. We're, we're going to close on applied underwriters in just a, probably a few days. And those are two terrific guys. Build it up from absolutely nothing. I uh, actually bought a tiny business here in Omaha, as I explained in the report, is why it's here. But they wanted to come with Berkshire. They think their own, they're keeping 19% of the company. They think their own future will be the best in many ways, including financially, I'm sure, that, uh, of, of, of being associated with us. They feel it's the best place for the people, have the most opportunity to grow. And, you know, they came to us directly. And, uh, you know, I don't know how many stories you read about a $4 billion deal as appeared today in connection with this car where, you know, it doesn't say anything about an investment banker uh, on either side, but but uh, uh, you'll see more of those, I think, with Berkshire over the years. Charlie, do you have anything particular to add on our acquisitions recently? Well, the interesting thing about it to me is the mindset. With all of these new helpers in the world, they talk about doing deals. That is not the mindset at, at Berkshire. We're, we are trying to welcome partners. It's a totally different mindset. The guy who's doing a deal, he wants to do the deal and unwind the deal and not too far ahead and make a large profit, et cetera. And that's not our mindset at all. We like the things that we can buy and that never leave us. And we like the relationships that last and are fruitful, not just for us, but for the people working there and the customers and everybody else. I think our system is going to work better long term than flipping a lot of deals. And we have so many new deal flippers in the game that I think they're going to get in one another's way. In other words, I don't think there's enough money out there to have all this new class make all the money they expect to make on a permanent basis, just flipping, 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 flipping. Uh, They'll make it on fees, 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 fees. Uh, <laughs> Warren reminds me, once I asked a man who just left a large investment bank, and I said, how does your firm make its money? He said, off the top, off the bottom, off both sides, and in the middle. <laughs> I know which firm he's talking about, too. <laughs> That's not our culture, and a lot of you have been here so long, you can see that's not our culture, but in the end, it may be that Omaha will do better than Wall Street. Can you describe a little bit more specifically how a derivatives meltdown might progress and ultimately get resolved after it's been precipitated? And is there a plausible way to resolve it without some sort of a major bailout that would exacerbate a too big to fail moral hazard problem? It's really hard to tell. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, what, what will cause people to yell fire? What will, how many people will rush for the exits? What they'll do when they get there? And, it, it happens occasionally, you know, with LTCM, Long-Term Capital Management, 1998, you know, it affected the financial world in a big way. It didn't affect it in the biggest way. I mean, the, the Fed stepped in, but there were some pretty pretty strange things happened during that period uh, in markets. Uh, what happened in the junk bond market in 2002? I mean, it, it closed for a while almost, and it was chaos. Uh, so. It's very hard to know exactly what would happen. I'll, I'll give Charlie a, a question here. In, in 1991, when we were in Solomon, it was in August, middle of August, and on a Sunday, we were within probably a half an hour 
of seeking out a federal judge to turn over the keys of the place to him and, and, and go into bankruptcy. And fortunately, the Treasury reversed itself, and we got out of that particular predicament. But, but the law firm was drawing up the papers for bankruptcy. Now, that was on a Sunday. What would have happened Monday? And we had a good, we had for those days a good sized derivative book. It would be peanuts now, but it was, it looked big at the time. We had a lot of security settlements due the next day. Now, that happened to be the same day that, uh, that uh, Gorbachev was spirited away and and the Dow opened down a couple hundred points the next day off of a much lower Dow. Now, if you had superimposed upon that the fact that Solomon failed in Japan starting at 7 o'clock or so the previous night and that it was, it was if you were delivering securities to them against payment the next day, you weren't going to get paid. And if you were expecting securities, uh, from them, you weren't going to get those securities. And by the way, you had a, I think a six or seven hundred billion dollar derivative book, and people who had traded off those derivatives had to try and figure out where they stood and scrambled around and whether their counterparties weren't going. Uh, what, what, what do you think would have happened on that Monday, Charlie? <laughs> well, it, it could have been absolute chaos. That was a very interesting story. <laughs> with an interesting moral. Nick Brady really prevented that bankruptcy, and he knew about Berkshire Hathaway from having been a family shareholder with the Chases yeah. way, way back. And that had caused him to f follow the matter with interest, particularly since he'd sold his own stock and watched his relatives, the Chases, hold theirs. So he, he knew about us, and I think he trusted you, Warren, and I think that mattered that day. So these old-fashioned reputational... But, but what would have happened the next day? I, I, well, it, it, it was terrifying, I'll put it yeah, that way. Yeah, it, it was terrifying, and, but there was an element of personal reputation and the avoidance of finding out what would have happened that next day. Kim Chase, who I introduced you to earlier, his father actually introduced me to Nick Brady many, many years earlier, in the mid-60s, when Nick was working, was at Dillon Reed, and, and, and Malcolm Chase said, I'd like you to meet, but, uh, I guess he was a nephew or a grandnephew. In any event, I went over to uh, Dillon Reed, and uh, I would have been in my 30s then, and, and Nick was a few years older, and, and we had a good time talking, and then uh, in 1991, he was Secretary of the Treasury, and the Treasury had issued a death sentence to us at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and, and fortunately, uh, Nick reversed that about 2.30 in the afternoon. And if he hadn't, it, I, just, I don't know what would have happened, but that would have been a kind of a, a pilot case uh, for a, a mild derivatives, daisy chain type panic, but that would be nothing compared to something now. If, if, if Now, there's way more of the stuff that is collateralized these days than formerly, but uh, uh, it would not be a, it's not an experiment you would want to voluntarily conduct, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Valuation, if either of you were looking at a newspaper stock today and watching them fall, as some people may categorize falling knives, what would you use to determine or how would you determine a very comfortable margin of safety? The question is what, what, multiple, you should, what, what multiple should you pay for a business that's earning $100 million a year, call it pre-tax? whose earnings are going to go down 5% a year compared to what you should pay for a business with a, that's earning $100 million a year that's earning, whose earnings are going to go up 5% a year. And I would say that, I'm not saying that those are percentages I predict on newspaper companies, but certainly newspaper companies face the prospect of their newspaper earnings eroding. And 
We've seen some of it already. We see every trend pointing in that direction. We own a, a newspaper ourselves. And, and uh, you know, I do not think the circulation of our paper will be larger in five years, and I don't think the advertising pages will be greater. And uh, I think that's true even of newspapers that operate in, in more prosperous, or actually more growing, I should say, uh, areas of the country than, than, than we do. So, but I don't think, I don't think most owners of papers still have quite gotten to the point where they start projecting out declining earnings. Uh, certainly multiples on newspaper stocks uh, are unattractively high if you would see some decline like five or six percent a year on earnings occurring for this point. They just, they're not cheap enough to compensate for that sort of erosion in earning power. And then you face the added risk that they may have a sort of a perception lag and that they may continue to use some of that money to, to buy other newspapers at prices which again don't make much sense. It's, it's pretty hard in a declining business to buy things cheap enough uh, to compensate for the decline uh, people in the business always tend to think that they're seeing the first robin, you know, or something, and, and that it's going to get better. And I would say the newspaper business, the decline, is, if anything, has is, is accelerated somewhat. I, uh, you know, when they, take, when they take people out to the cemetery, they're taking newspaper readers, and when people graduate from school, they're not gaining newspaper readers. And, and that may not uh, change things overnight, but it, it goes in the wrong direction. And the less the readers, the less the readership, the less compelling argument to have to advertisers. So that virtuous circle uh, where everybody read a paper because every ad was in it and every ad was in it because every everybody read a paper, that virtuous cycle is going in the other direction now. And I don't, uh, I don't think present prices for papers compensate for that. And you, you are now hearing from a couple of guys that just love newspapers. We think newspapers are indispensable, right. but we don't have a lot of, we have less company in that view than before. We, we love, I read five newspapers every day. Charlie probably does about the same. And, and Four. yeah, well, he's, it shows too. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you know, we, we, we couldn't live without them, but a lot of people can and more people can every day and now, we love the idea of buying newspapers. We travel to Cincinnati and sat in cheap hotels and tried all kinds of things to buy newspapers. But and we thought incidentally we 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 loved them as products and we and we thought they were the greatest of businesses, the ultimate bulletproof franchise. But it became apparent we were wrong of them. You know, we still love them as, news, as as products, but we were wrong about the bulletproof franchise and and, you know, when we, we got to believe our eyes in terms of what we're seeing in, in, in that world. Charlie? Yeah, I have an even greater sin to c admit to. I once thought General Motors was a bulletproof franchise. And, but we have a wonderful way of coping with a lot of these things. We have this too hard pile. I don't know if Warren is buying General Motors or, or, uh, or not, but I have a good guess. And, and, and it's, it's just too hard. If something is too hard to, to do, we look for something that isn't too hard to do. What could be more obvious than that? It may mean that we don't do very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't get into some specifics. <laughs> The news, it's, it's, I don't think anybody has watched the newspaper business much more carefully than Charlie and I have for really 50 years. We used to, we, we always talked about every paper in the country and, and the potential for buying it and all of that sort of thing. And it was a, it was easily understood. I mean, it was, it was about as easy an economic, a business economics problem as you could imagine. And we slowly woke up the, to change on it. Actually, I wrote in the 1991 annual report, uh, the newspaper 
the very the preprints of the world, you know, started turning the newspaper into a wrapper. It was contained a whole bunch of things that could have been contained in some other package. Now your newspaper was wasn't reproducible in some other package, but this this thing was carrying around a bunch of preprints. Now the question is: Is there a bunch? Is there are there easier ways to carry around those preprints? But there was nothing magical about the paper except it got inside the house and and brought the preprints inside the house. And as the newspaper lost penetration, it became a somewhat less efficient way of getting things into the house, and other other ways became more efficient at getting things into the house. And so there's these things. It's it's not a hard business to understand. And it has been interesting to me to watch both owners, direct owners, and investors in the business sort of resist seeing what's right in front of them. You know, that it, uh, it just it, it went so long the other way that you couldn't make a mistake buying a Monopoly newspaper. Nobody ever made a mistake buying one. You know, up until what, 1975 or 80 or something like that. Yeah. If the technology had not changed, they'd still be impregnable franchises. But the technology did change. Fortunately, carbide cutting tools appear to have no good substitute. It's a lot better business over time if you have the right management. I take, it takes very good management. The nice thing about the newspaper business 30 or 40 years ago, it took no management at all. I mean, it, it, if you had an idiot new nephew, you know, you uh, be a perfect – or a network television station. I mean, they, they were going to make money no matter what happened. They are going to make more money if they were under good management. I mean, if Tom Murphy was running your television stations, you were going to do much better than if you had your nephew doing it. But the nephew would have done all right. <laughs> And I'm wondering if you could provide us with a few names of some present-day mentors that we may look to for advice, as people similar to the uh, Grahams and the Fishers of the present day. Well, the interesting thing, you don't have to look at the present-day ones necessarily. I mean, if you wanted to look at great business careers, you could look at Tom Murphy or Don Keogh on our board, and you could learn everything you could learn about business person by just studying them and you don't have to study somebody that's that's that is 55 and currently in some executive position their lessons are are timeless and there's going to be a study i think the harvard business somebody sent it to me from the harvard business uh, school you know on cap cities but there's been others in the past and you know if you learn the lessons of tom murphy you don't need to learn any other lessons in terms of business and i would say if you learn the invest lessons of certain investors in the past, you know, you don't need to worry about a contemporary example. Charlie? Well, I think it's also true that Warren and I are not following very well the 40-year-old investment professionals. Isn't that right? Are you hiding something from no. me? I didn't know there were any 40-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they're all 25 now. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, No, the, the, the investing is not that is really not complicated. I mean, the, the the basic framework for it is simple. Now, then you you have to work at it some to find the best pockets of of uh, undervaluation, maybe or something. But you didn't have to have a you didn't have to have a high IQ. You didn't have to have lots of investment smarts to buy junk bonds in 2002 or even to do some of the stuff that was available when LTCM got in trouble, you really just had to have sort of the courage of your convictions. You had to have the willingness to do something when everybody else was petrified. And, but that was true in 1974 when you know, we were buying stocks at very, very, very low multiples of earnings. It wasn't that anybody didn't, didn't know that they were cheap. They were just paralyzed for one reason or another. And, and uh, you know, that, the lesson of following logic rather than emotion, you know, is something that it's obvious and some people have great trouble with it and others have less trouble. Charlie, can you give me any more help on that? Well, I think this is different. When we were young, we had way less competition than you people have now. There weren't very many smart people in the investment management field. 
They really weren't. And, and you should have seen the people who were in the bank trust departments. I mean, so now we've got armies of brilliant young people and all these private partnerships and all these proprietary desks and all the big investment banks. It's a, and we've got a vast amount of talent in the investment management business. So, and there's a lot of competition. If there were suddenly a crisis now, there would be 500 firms that would be studying it intensely, each having capital that they could commit on a hair trigger. In our day, we would frequently be all alone. But in 2002, we'd be the only buyer. We'd be the only buyer. But in 2002, Charlie, there were tons of people that had investment experience and high IQs, and lots of money was around. wasn't any question about money. It's just they were terrified of that particular arena. Well, when you have a huge convulsion, which is like a big fire in this auditorium right now, you know, you get a lot of weird behavior. And if you, <laughs> and if you can, particularly at the head table, <laughs> and, and, and if you can be wise when everybody else is going crazy, sure there will still be opportunities, but that may give you a long, dull stretches if that's your strategy. Three years ago, two, three years ago, you could find a number of securities in Korea, population 50 million, advanced society strong balance sheets, strong industry positions at three or so times earnings. Now, But that took a convulsion to create that, a, well, real, a big convulsion. Yeah, but the convulsion happened three or four years earlier, yeah. five, five years earlier, and plenty of smart people in Korea in the investment business, plenty of smart people here scouring. The information was all available. You, 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 can, you can go to the Internet and get information about Korean companies that's just as good as you get up from the SEC. And there they were, dozens of companies at very, very, very cheap prices. Now, where are, all, where are all these smart people and with all this money? <laughs> it did happen, but if I asked you to name 20 more like it, you would have great difficulty. I'm not going to name them. <laughs> if you were starting out today with a million dollars, with a vision of building a business with 20% average growth in value over 40 years, what type of investments and investment strategy would you look to make in the first five years? Well, it's somewhat interesting that uh, we formed the first partnership 50 years ago, last two days ago, Thursday, on May 4th, 1956, which was 105,000. Uh, that's my sister clapping. She, would, she was in the partnership. <laughs> The, uh, you know, we would, if Charlie and I were starting all over again and we were in this, Charlie would say we shouldn't be doing this, but, but uh, if, we, if we were to succumb to Satan and engage in the same kind of activity, we would, uh, I think, be doing something very similarly. If we were investing in securities, we would look around the world and we would look at a Korea and Charlie says you can't find 20 of them, but you don't have to find 20 of them. You only have to find, you only have to find one, really. You do not have to have tons of good ideas in this business. You just have a good idea that's worth a ton occasionally. And in securities, we would, we would be doing the same thing, which would probably mean smaller stocks. It would mean smaller stocks because we would find things that could have an impact uh, on a small portfolio that will have no impact on a portfolio the size of Berkshire. Uh, if we were trying to buy businesses, we'd have a tough time. Um, we would have no reputation, uh, so people would not be coming to us. Uh, we'd be too small a player if you're talking about a million dollars. So we, we would not have much success, I don't think, with small amounts buying businesses. Charlie started out you know, in real estate development because it took very, very little capital. And you could magnify brain power and energy, uh, uh, or I should say brain power and energy could magnify sm small amounts of capital in, in a huge way that was not true in securities. Um, you know, my natural inclination was to look at securities and, and just kind of do it one foot in front of the other over time. Uh, uh, but 
the basic principles wouldn't be different. Uh, you know, I think if I'd been running a partnership a couple of years ago with a small amount of money, I think I'd have probably been 100% in Korea. And, uh, you know, I would be looking around for something that was very mispriced and, which, and, and that I understood. And every now and then that's going to happen. Charlie? Well, I agree with that. The concept that you're likely to find just one thing where it'll make 20% per annum and you just sit back for the next 40 years, that tends to be dreamland. And in the real world, you, you have to find something that you can understand that's the best you have available. And, uh, and once you found the best thing, then you measure everything against that because it's your opportunity cost. That's the way small sums of money should be invested. And the trick, of course, is, is getting enough expertise that your opportunity cost, meaning your default option, which is still pretty good, is very high. And so the, the game hasn't changed at all in terms of its basic arithmetic. And that's why modern portfolio theory is so asinine. They, it really is, folks. It, yeah. <laughs> when Warren said he would have been all in one country, that's pretty close to, close to right. He wouldn't have quite done that when he had the partnership. But he would have been way more concentrated than is conventional if you listen to modern portfolio theory. Most people aren't going to find thousands of things that are equally good. They're going to find a few things where one or two of them are way better than anything else they know. And, uh, and the right way to think about in investing is to act thinking about your best opportunity cost. Number nine. It's in the freshman course in economics everywhere in the basic textbook, it just had a, hasn't made its way into modern portfolio theory. We don't get asked to do book reviews. <laughs> Jeremy Siegel had some ideas in his second book, and I would like to understand what, how this would impact your investment strategies, um, if there are any changes from his ideas, and um, how you react to these recommendations that he makes. Jeremy Siegel, the second book, by yeah. the try and the true triumph over the world and the new. No, that, 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 it's had no effect on, on us. Charlie? Hmm. No, is that the fellow who is very optimistic about common yeah. stock investment over long periods of time? The University of Pennsylvania, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he's demented. <laughs> <laughs> well. He's a, he's a very nice guy, Charlie. Well, he, he, he may be, well be a very nice guy, but he's comparing apples against elephants and trying to make accurate projections. Number 10. <laughs> I'd just like to hear you guys provide some detail on the importance of using an effective decision-making process, even though it may lead to some bad outcomes and underperformance in the short run. Yeah, well, Ben Graham said long ago that you're neither right nor wrong because people agree with you or disagree with you. In other words, being, being contrarian has no special virtue over being a trend follower. Or a, a, you're right because your facts and reasoning are right. So all you do is you try to make sure that the facts you have are correct, and that's usually pretty easy to do in this country. I mean, the information is available on all kinds of things. Internet makes it even easier. And then once you have the facts, you got to think through what they mean. And you don't take a public opinion survey. You don't pay attention to things that are unimportant. I mean, what you're looking for is something, things that are important and knowable. If something's important but unknowable, forget it. I mean, it may be important in order to know whether somebody's going to drop a, a nuclear weapon tomorrow, but you know, it's unknowable. 
It may be all kinds of things. But so you fo and, and there are all kinds of things that are knowable but are not important. In focusing on business and investment decisions, you try to think of, you, you narrow it down to the things that are knowable and important, and then you decide whether you have information of sufficient value that, you know, compared to price and all of that, that, that will cause you to act. What others are doing means nothing. It's price and all of that, that that will cause you to act. What others are doing means nothing. It's what Graham writes in Chapter 8 of The Intelligent Investor, that the market is there to serve you and not to instruct you. That's of enormous importance. When people talk about momentum in stocks or, or charting or any kind of things like that, they're saying that the market is instructing you. The market doesn't instruct us. The market is there to serve us. If it does something silly, we get a chance to do something because it's doing something silly, we do it. But it doesn't tell us anything. It just tells us prices. And if the price is out of line with where the facts and reasoning lead you, then you then action is called for. And if it doesn't, you forget it and, you know, go play bridge that day and the next day see whether there's something new. And the nice thing about it is there always is something new. I mentioned the LTCM crisis. You know, we on Sunday from people that had portfolios that were in trouble. Now, I will tell you that if you can make a lot of money on Sunday, you may not get a chance very often, but any calls you get on Sunday, you're probably gonna make money on. <laughs> things, are, things are really screwed up if you're getting calls on Sunday. And all you have to do is make sure that you're the callee and not the caller <laughs> on Sunday. And, and but if you get those calls, you get a call on a Sunday and somebody says that the off the run is trading 30 basis points away from the on the run, you know, all you have to do is decide whether, how you handle that particular piece of information, whether it's correct in the first place, but how you handle that piece of information, whether you can play out your hand. You never get in a position, obviously, where the other fellow can call your tune. You have to be able to play out your hand under all circumstances. But if you can play out your hand, and you've got the right facts, and you reason by yourself, and you let the market serve you and not instruct you, you can't miss. Charlie? Well, I would say some of you probably can miss. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Charlie can't miss, I'll put it that way. <laughs> He'll agree with that. <laughs> the Berkshire uh, annual report, what numbers in the balance sheet or the cash flows would tell you that Berkshire is underpriced, and what numbers would you look at to determine if Berkshire is overpriced? We take it very seriously. We try to put everything in that report that we would want to know if the positions were reversed. If I were sitting with all of my net worth in Berkshire and had been on a, on a desert island for a year and, I, and the manager was reporting to me about the business, we try to have that same information that I would want from him, and we try to present it to you in a way that's understandable. And we don't leave out things that we, uh, we think are important. Uh, we try not to put, I mean, there's, uh, it runs about 76, I think, or maybe even 80 pages this year. I mean, there's, you can drown people in information that, that really doesn't make much difference. But we've tried to organize it in a way by talking about these different groups of businesses. We try to explain how we think about it in terms of things like the amount of operating earnings we've generated and the, and the, and the investments we have. It's really as if it's a report that I was making to Charlie or Charlie would be making to me if one of us were inactive in the business and, and, and the other was running it. And uh, uh, so I think, I mean, it may take a few hours to do it, but I think if you regard yourself as a serious owner of Berkshire, it's really worth reading the whole report, thinking about what is there, what are these guys going to do with it, you know, what are they trying to attempt, what are the odds they're going to be successful in, attempt, in that attempt, what are they, you know, what is it worth if they don't succeed very well in, in deploying additional capital. Uh, what might be the case if they were successful in, 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 in deploying uh, excess capital and incremental capital. Um, but I can tell you that obviously we think it's very important what counts is the kind of businesses we have, 
the kind of managers we have running those businesses, what those businesses are likely to earn over time, and we've expressed ourselves a little on that. And then what are the resources that are available to keep adding to that collection of businesses? What are the kind of businesses we are looking to add? And uh, I think, you know, I, th I, th I, th I think you'll find the information that's, that you need to evaluate Berkshire. And it's not a, you know, you don't carry it out to four decimal places. Charlie and I, if we had to stick a number down on a piece of paper right now as to some pinpoint number, we wouldn't do it because we know that's impossible. But if we had to stick a number down, you know, it'd be a different number between the two of us. It'd be a, n a different number if I did it today from tomorrow, probably. Uh, but we'd be in the same ballpark and we'd be looking at the same things and the things we would be looking at, we report to you in, in, in that report. Uh, um, I would focus the question of what Berkshire's gonna be worth 10 years from now will depend on the, on the earnings that we have developed annual earnings that we've developed by that time, the quality of those earnings, the possibilities going forward from that point of those businesses, and the liquid assets we have. And we've worked on increasing both of those uh, elements over the years, and we'll keep working on it. And it's a lot tougher in terms of percentage gains from this point forward than it was in the past. There's no way in the world that we can replicate what's happened in the past. It just won't happen. The question is, is whether we can do a reasonable job or not. Charlie? Yeah, I generally try and uh, approach a complex like, task like the one you presented by quickly disposing of what I call the no-brainer decisions, and meaning the easy ones. I think if you go through all the operating insurance that don't involve surplus cash, and the insurance operations, that that's the easiest valuation process in Berkshire. And the insurance operation is very interesting. And so is the process by which the huge amounts of excess cash are c continually redeployed. But I would go at it in that sequence taking the no-brainers first. Would you please discuss how your underwriting standards have changed as the weather patterns seem to have become more severe, the challenges of global terrorism seem to escalate, and unforeseen supercat events such as earthquakes and pandemics? The development of the float is a different question. That really depends on how much business we write in the future and the nature of the business, whether it's long tail or short tail. I think it will be very hard to increase our float of 48 or 9 billion at a, at a big clip in the future. I mean, it, I've been amazed at what's happened in the past on this. It's done way better than Charlie and I ever would have dreamt. But, you know, we have, we're getting to where we're close to 10% of the float of the entire American insurance, property casualty insurance industry. And some of it's abroad that we have. But it just can't, it can't grow it at very rapid rates, but it can be very attractive, and, and so far it has been. Uh, in terms of the questions about underwriting, in terms of pandemics or uh, terrorism and all of that, I mean, you know, I'm aware of them, you're aware of them. We get propositions offered to us virtually every day, and, and in the end, I mostly at Jeet, I mean, in this particular case, uh, in terms of big type contracts. Financial type contracts, I'm, I would evaluate, he would, but we talk about what we think the probabilities are of, of $50 billion events and up, or $20 billion events and up, and he's the fellow that does most of, he, he applies it, but we, we kick around the possibilities. But that's, that's all there is to it. I mean, it is a, it's a question of making judgments about whether you're getting paid enough, and if we have a lot of money you know, 30 years from now, it'll mean that our judgments overall were, were, were decent. And if we have a big loss on one this year, it does not mean that our judgment's wrong because it, it's going to lead to peaks and valleys. Um, but there's no magic to it. Uh, there's probably, I would feel that the earthquake experience of the last 100 or 200 years 
has more validity than the windstorm or the hurricane experience of the last 100 or 200 years. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I would, I would bet real money that way, and we have. Uh, what, what, is, what will hurricane experience be like 10 years from now in terms of the number of, of those that hit the United States uh, and, the, and the ferocity of the ones that do hit? You know, I don't know, but I'll keep thinking about it every day. Charlie? <laughs> well, I think the laws of thermodynamics are such that if the oceans get warmer, and I think they are getting warmer, the weather is going to be uh, have more high energy uproar in it. So I think we'd be out of our minds if we wrote w weather related insurance on the theory that that global warming would have no effect at all. And the natural reaction is to raise your prices as the risks go up. And whether you've raised them enough and carefully controlled your risks enough, that's the art of the business. Yeah, and you have this possibility that, you know, 1% changes or 2% changes in something can produce 100% probabilistic changes in and cost, and so it's it's an explosive sort of equation that you're dealing with, and you know. But that's the game we're in, and and uh, uh, we don't have to play it ever. If we don't like what we're being offered, and we didn't like what we were being offered a while back in in many areas, uh, somebody else can take our place in line. We'll be happy to have them. How did you get that? Well. <laughs> I will try that. I'm not sure I understood the whole. I think she's asking about the health care business. Yeah, that, that part I got. And whether or not, with the much bad ethics being present, uh, we have anything to contribute about doing well in that sector. Is that about right? Yes. Yeah. No, no, we're not. No, I understand the question. I still, it's still yours. <laughs> I'd be glad to answer, but I'm eating candy at the moment. <laughs> that has tended to go into the too hard pile <laughs> at Berkshire. A lot of people have made a lot of money writing health insurance, and I've watch the behavior of some of those people for wearing my hat as the chairman of a big central city hospital. And you are right, there's a lot of bad ethics in health care. There's also a lot of good ethics. It's a very, very complex field with a lot of change, a lot of technological differences. Uh, and in terms of investments, uh, I think the policy has generally been that it all goes into the too hard pile. We, we, we don't, and that's Warren has some thing he's keeping secret from me. No, we, we have not owned much in healthcare. But, um, my only expertise is in diet. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I appreciate the, the seriousness of the question is, you know, there, it is just, it is a very, very tough problem on which I have no particular insights. And you're right, the worst of the ethics is really bad. The Chapter 11 bankruptcy process, I know you uh, have been active in the past in some uh, activity in the bankruptcy court, and if you uh, had thoughts on possible reforms in that area, if you believe that any reforms are necessary. Well, that's a good question. Charlie's probably better qualified to answer than, than I am. I mean, we have, we have bought, bought Fruit of the Loom out of, a, out of bankruptcy, and we, we, we have had some involvement in owning junk bonds. You know, we get, uh, we think about the bankruptcy process, but in terms of the practicalities of improving on it, what, what do you think, Charlie? Well, I think much of that is pretty horrible. You have a competition there where the courts themselves have gone into bidding 
contests to get bankruptcy business attracted, meaning that the, there are various courts that can handle bankruptcy cases, and they have found that if they develop a culture where they overpay a lot of people egregiously, they can attract more business, lawyers, trustees, consultants, et cetera, et cetera. I find this so unpleasant to watch that I don't pay as much attention to bankruptcy as I probably should. You know, I'm an old man and I don't like to have an upset stomach. <laughs> well, we, we, will, we look at, at least I do, I'm not sure about Charlie, but he, uh, we, you know, bankruptcies will be something that, that we will, one way or another over the next 20 years, we'll have various ways of, of participating and we have bought, well, we bought certain of the bonds, for example, of Enron after they uh, entered bankruptcy. We bought something called the Ospreys. And a complicated bankruptcy can offer uh, opportunities for profit. Now, there's so many people looking at bankruptcies currently or potential bankruptcies. It's a field that I would say does not have a lot of promise right now, but it has had promise in the past. Uh, uh, we actually, in the, fruit of, in the Fruit of the Loom situation, I first went into that just by buying some Fruit of the Loom bonds with, when I had no notion that we might uh, conceivably end up with a company. But, the, you know, I knew enough about it to buy the bonds. And, um, and Enron comes along, and it's a big mess. The Penn Central came along 20-odd years ago, and it was a big mess. And there was a lot of money made in the Penn Central simply because it was such a, a complicated mess. So anytime... There's something big, complicated. There's certainly a good chance of mispricing. Now, lately, the mispricing may be more on the high side than on the low side. But, but over time, you're going to find some, there, there will be some attractive things to do uh, in bankruptcy situations. We've had other bankruptcy situations um, where we've gotten involved in the process and then been out, outbid. It happened at Burlington and it happened at Cytel and but we owned all the bonds at Cytel, so we came out we came out fine. Uh, it, it, it's something to understand if you're in the business of buying investments or uh, or businesses. And I would say that you know if we're around for another ten or fifteen years, that we'll do something or other, uh, maybe maybe substantial in the bankruptcy field. The, the Enrons, um, the payment's still being made in various ways, but but uh, the Ospreys, which were kind of a complicated situation, uh, the whole thing was complicated. But you know, we didn't buy at the bottom or anything like that. But you know, we considerably more than tripled our money in in something that you could have put a fair amount of money in. So they can be interesting. Charlie, do you want to? Well, I remember the Eastern Airlines bankruptcy, where there were a lot of employees that would have, and communities that would have been affected. And the courts in that case, I would say, abused the senior creditors horribly. And so... You would have found out you'd guessed wrong. It's, it's a very interesting field. Yeah, it, and, it, and it can be very unpredictable. In the Penn Central case, you had an incredible variety of claims. I mean, you had leased lines and you had all kinds of first and second liens and everything. And the, the judge, as I remember, I may be wrong a little bit on this on the details, but as I remember, the judge just looked at this incredible, probably the most complicated bankruptcy that had come down the pike in the history of bankruptcy to that point. And he just said, this is just too damn complicated. I'm just sort of going to ignore the various priorities and all this. I'm just going to perhaps they might call it substantive consolidation or something. I'm just going to put this all together and I'm going to give you a quick, fast solution. And I think it was a very smart way to handle things because otherwise I think Penn Central might still be going. But it wasn't what the book said would be done. At, uh, judges, judges can determine things in a very big way. I remember when we were in Cincinnati on that newspaper case I mentioned earlier, I said, Charlie, a judge had stayed in order, I think, for a week or something like that. And, and, and 
I said to Charlie, I said, how much power does a federal judge have? And Charlie says, well, for a while, as much as he thinks he has. <laughs> I learned a lot out of that. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the short and long-term fit for P&G's pharmaceutical business? For just the pharmaceutical business, or did you say? Long-term growth of P&G as a whole. As a whole, yeah. Well, you know, I think it's clear that P&G is a consumer powerhouse of sorts, and, and I think Gillette in its field, they had just about as strong a consumer position as anybody will ever have, and when you get into blades and razors, stronger than the most of the P&G brands, strong as they may be. And I do think that the big retailers are, are becoming, and more so all the time, brands of their own and they are becoming, and there's more and more concentration going on. So I think the struggle between the manufacturers of brands and retailers will go on and on and on and become more intensified. So I would think if I were on either side of that equation, I would want to be strengthening my hand. And I think that, I, th I think the future of both Gillette and P&G uh, uh, are better as a combined enterprise than they would have been as a separate enterprise. And I think that's particularly true uh, because of the strengths of the Walmarts and the Costcos and you name it around the world. I don't know, how do you see it, Charlie? He also wants you to tell him how P&G will be affected by its pharmaceutical business. I don't know a thing about that. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> I really don't. I'd, I'd help if I could, but I can't. I'm currently employed by Oriental Trading Company, yeah. and they just announced that they were putting themselves up for sale. I was just wondering if Berkshire would have any interest in a company like Oriental Trading Company as an acquisition. That's, that's interesting. Ed. I didn't know they'd put themselves up for sale, but I looked at it whenever it was four or five years ago when uh, uh, Terry Watnabe sold it, and I, I haven't really followed it since then, but just from listening to what you say, and I, and I have no knowledge of it at all, but it sounds to me as if some private group bought it and now they're, they're reselling it. And we, we get approached on that sort of thing all the time where, where uh, a financial group has bought the business and, the, and then wants to resell it uh, fairly quickly. And they, they almost invariably, well, they invariably, I would say, auction the, the business. They seek what they call a strategic buyer. A strategic buyer is some guy that pays too much because, you know, and, and he wants to justify it, so he says it's strategic. I mean, I, I have never understood being a strategic buyer. Every time somebody calls me up and says, you know, we think maybe you're the logical strategic buyer for that, you know, I hang up faster than Charlie would. The, uh, I, I'm not talking to the specifics of this one at all because I really don't know on Oriental Trading. But the idea that we're going to find a business to buy from some guy from the, who from the moment he bought it a few years ago has been thinking, how do I get out of this thing? You know, what do I do to make it earn, have those figures for a couple of years look a certain way so that I can get the maximum amount in a couple of years? You know, that we're just not going to make any attractive buys there. We won't trust the figures. You know, we, it just, it's, it, what we like is a business that, where the guy before was running with the idea of running it 100 years and t taking care of the business in every way possible and was not contemplating sale, but for one reason or another, uh, finally needs to monetize the company. We won't, we will not get any, we will not get any sensible buys really from the resellers. I, some of the, it's amazing to me what's going on. Some of these things literally, you know, Fund A is selling to Fund B, to Fund C. I mean, I've seen some that change hands three or four times. They're just marking them up, and everybody's getting two and two. they're getting twenty percent of the profits as they mark it up. And probably Fund C or Fund D, it may be owned by the same pension funds that own Fund A, except that everybody's just taking a big, a big uh, uh, twenty percent slice out of it every time they they uh, move it from one place to another. We're not buyers of anything. The financial 
buyers have been in and re you know, currently own. Charlie? In the uh, 1930s, there was a stretch when certain kinds of real estate, when with certain kinds of real estate, you could borrow more against the real estate than you could sell it for. And I think that's happened in some of these private equity deals. And uh, it's weird. It's weird. This is not our field. If you look at the income on assets, the U.S. investors are still in a net positive position. That they went, is, they went, we, they went negative in the last quarter, actually. Oh, excuse yeah. me. Okay, so, so it's been close. Um, so I guess my question is, do these facts influence your concern or may, maybe mitigate your concern about the current, current account deficit? And the second part of the question is, do you have any cultural reasons why the U.S. should earn more on investments abroad than foreign investors earn on domestic investments? How do you reconcile your views with gambling versus the insurance industry? Well, gambling, I think, it, I think the distinction that usually is made is that gambling involves creating risks that don't need to be created. I mean, if, if uh, you want to go out and gamble on whether where a little ball is going to fall on a wheel that's revolving, that is not something that that is cre a created a created risk. Whereas, if you've got a home or a business, you know, in a, on a coastal area, uh, the risk is there. It it wasn't created intentionally. I mean, you can say you build in that place, but and then the the question is who bears it. So. There's a transfer of, in the case of cat coverage, large existing risks as opposed to the creation of a risk that, that, that is not required. I mean, you can, you can watch a football game without, without betting on it, but you can't live in a house you know, on, on, on a Florida coast without, without having a risk that your entire investment uh, disappears. So that, 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 that's the distinction, basically. I hope you're right that the House wins in both cases. And <laughs> Charlie? Well, well, I don't think I can add to that either. The whole concept of the House advantage is a very interesting one in, in, in modern commerce. A lot of the investment management operations, which were not ordinarily spoken of in the past in croupier terms, but the terms of a lot of private equity investment now. I think the, I think the proprietors of the, of the partnerships are taking a house edge that looks a lot like the rake of the croupier in Monte Carlo, except it's bigger. Is there anyone we've forgotten to insult? I want to make sure we don't miss anyone here. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the issue of illegal naked short selling? As you know, I, you may know, I have a friend that's been fairly outspoken on that. And we, from our standpoint, we have no objection to anybody selling Berkshire short at all. Uh, the uh, the more shorts, the better, because they have to buy the stock later on. And some of our shareholders may make some money lending. We can't, Charlie and I can't do it, but, but there's nothing I would love better if it were legal than to lend my stock to shorts and have them pay me something for doing it. Uh, uh, I might want to get prepaid in certain cases. The, uh, there's nothing evil per se about, in my view, about selling things short. Um, I would say that it's a very, very tough way to make a living. It's not only often painful financially, it's very painful uh, emotionally because it, a stock that you sell short, a stock that you buy at 20 can go down 20 points and a stock that you sell short at 20 can go up an infinite amount and you don't think about that until you've gone short and it goes up about 10 or 15 points and then you don't sleep very well. So it's a, it's a very tough way to make a living. 
there are people on the short side that have done and that do things to try to make stocks go down, some of which are appropriate and some of which are inappropriate. There are people on the long side that have done the same exact, uh, the same sort of things go on. So I don't see any, I, I have no, uh, no ax to grind in the least against, against short sellers. And in terms of what they call naked shorting, which you, which means that you, you don't have the stock lined up to be borrowed, and maybe you have a whole bunch of fails to deliver and that sort of thing. Um, I don't have, I, I don't, I don't have a great, a, a great problem with that. If anybody wants to do that with Berkshire, you know, they, they, uh, more power to them. Uh, short sellers. The, the situations in which there have been huge short interests very often, uh, very often have been later revealed to be uh, frauds or semi-frauds. Now, the, the one my friend runs is not at all, but the, the batting average, I mean, I've, over the years, I probably had 100 ideas of things that should be shorted, and I would say that Almost every one of them have turned out to be correct, and I'll bet if I'd tried to do it and make money out of it, I probably would have lost money. I would have had no fun, and the opportunity cost, as Charlie said, would have been enormous because if somebody's running something that's semi-fraudulent, they're probably pretty good at it, and they're working full-time at it, and uh, they've succeeded for a while, and they may keep succeeding, and if they succeed and you go in at X and it goes to 5X, you know, all you're hoping after a while is that it goes back to X again or something of the sort. It's a, it's a very tough psychological uh, game to play. A few people may be well suited for it. Uh, I would never put any money with a short fund, but not because I would think it would be ethically wrong. I just think that they're unlikely to make money. Um, Charlie, do you have any thoughts on short selling or naked short selling? Well, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that it's, that would be one of the most ir irritating experiences in the world, to figure out something is crooked and foolish and so forth, and then short it at X and have it go to 3X. Now you're watching all these happy crooks splashing around in your money while you're meeting margin calls. <laughs> why would you want to go inhaling distance of an experience like that? <laughs> 